in the world. I am here today with Simon Raymond of Bella Union record label and Lost Horizons, the amazing band and the Cocteau Twins and so much more coming to us from Brighton, correct? Beautiful Brighton down by the South Coast in England. And it's beautiful to be with you, whoever you are. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> And then just to make sure that everybody can, you know, can see things and all of that good jazz, I'm just going to make sure that this feed is, you know, sharing to, um, dun, 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 that we are sharing. I'm going to share this to the Global Cafe. And Simon, if you want to share it to, um, you know, you can share it to your page, etc. cetera. Um, oh, Jeff is sharing it too. That's so fun. I Jeff like Payton, that. Jeff Payson, he's a um, he's a DJ, and it was so funny. So last night, one of my friends was like, "Oh, you need to let Jeff know that you're doing this." This Jeff's a DJ in Chicago. I don't know if you know how well you know Chicago clubs, but there's a club called Neo and Club 950, and um, Club Now that plays your music is Late Bar. So yeah. like those those types of so anyhow, we got to be friends. We're messaging back and forth and he's like oh he's like have you seen the inside photos from the drowning craze record he's like you've got to see like the inside photos from that record and so yeah they are pretty funny the big yeah. hair the, big, the very big hair very yeah. big hair very but big everybody hair. had big hair in the 80s eh? Well, you know we weren't doing anything particularly new i mean you look back at photographs of most bands who were doing something a little bit left of center and you know most people's hair was a bit all over the place yeah so is that how you would would you classify yourself as a left of center human oh very much so yes i'm a socialist yes uh, if, there, if there can be such a thing in, in these dark times um but yeah, I mean, I, I've, 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 over here, what would be the Labour Party? I've supported the Labour Party pretty much all my life. So, um, whilst there's not much to be cheerful about as far as you know our governments and politics go these days, uh, you know, it's still what I believe in. Um, and quite ironically, I suppose that the government right now here in the UK, which is very right wing, um, like your own, uh, is being forced to be quite socialist because of what's going on, you know? Um, and that's quite a quite bizarre kind of turnaround of events. I, I don't think it's happening in your country yet because um, your your president is just a little on the strange side, but- um, <laughs> To say um, the least. To say the least, but you know, politics is not my uh, area of um, expertise. It's not mine either, but it's still fun to kind of, you know, go there. Which yeah, actually go there. I mean, you know, it's just I, I don't really like the way society works in general. I've always sort of felt like a bit of an outsider. Oh, where did he go? It looked almost like he like leaned on a key and um 86 himself, but I'm sure he'll be right back in just a second. All he has to do is click the link. Simon, just click that link and you'll be back in a GIF. You'll be back in a jiffy. Um, but while he's gone, just so you know our plan for today the agenda according to simon and i will say this <laughs> because this means that we could be here for a long time of fun is everything and nothing so that's quite the agenda the agenda is everything and nothing and simon is back he's going to be back in just a gif just uh oh goes to the machine and i can hear myself like Oh, okay. if you turn down your audio a little bit. I'm going to turn it down a lot. How's that? That's fine. Is it good on your end? No, if there's a horrible echo, but I'll, I'll, I'll manage. I don't want any horrible echoes. The, the last thing you need is distortion, eh? Yeah, that's um, really it was absolutely perfect a minute ago. Let me just, um, you, you carry on asking me stuff and I'll... Well, and you can always like drop off and drop back on if you want. Do you know, Davey, we've got, we've got Davey Purves, he's Lost Horizon, oh, hello. one of the best albums in the last decade, a must listen. Oh, hey, Davey, how are you? That's nice of you to say so. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I thought it was a pretty good record too, but <laughs> my opinion is really worth very little these days. So uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm right in the middle of making a new one. 
Um, I'll tell you what, I am going to drop out and, and try drop and- Drop out for a second. Phone. We'll geek out and I'll, I'll do a little announcement. I'm going to kick you off and then you can come back. Um, there, I kicked him off to make it easier. Um, you know, there's always a technical something. We try to have things be perfect, but it's not. And I'm just glad that it works the way it does, you know, that it works at all. So if you have any questions, as you can see, I can bring in questions, I can bring in comments, and we can bring them up to Simon. So if and when you want to question or comment, do so in the stream and we can bring it on in. And once again, thanks for joining us. Hey, Simon, is that better? Yeah. Kind of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely. I mean, I can turn my headphones on. Yeah, oh, yeah. Do you have headphones? Try the headphones. Oh, no, let's just let it because otherwise, too much thing, too many things get in the way, and too I'll probably many. break something and knock, knock my drink over. Anyway, too cheers, everyone. Are you just, you're just having, oh, I'm going to do cheers. And I am, I am drinking PG tips. So, so we had an interesting little exchange yesterday about tea. So you say that PG tips is better for caffeinated, but that Tetley is better for the decaf. It's true. I mean, I've always been a, a complete aficionado of the, of the PG tips. Um, we actually spoke about this the very first time we met in, uh, in, uh, in, in France all those years ago. But um, yeah, we, I ran out of tea and I was like, went to the supermarket and I was kind of needed to stop drinking so much caffeine. And I thought, I'll buy some decaf, PG Pips, and I bought some and they were just horrible. Um, so I thought, I'll try tea, I'll try techniques, maybe they'll be slightly better. And they were absolutely gorgeous. So that's actually my favorite drink, is caffeinated uh, Tetley tea. Who knew? Yeah. Who knew? Because I've every time I've tried decaf English breakfast of any variety it's tasted kind of like just dark dark water apparently chris jackson says that yorkshire tea is the best well these good point there yorkshire tea is absolutely gorgeous that's a little bit too strong for me i uh, i'm gonna try i mean i think i'm gonna try that i'll try yorkshire i when we were in scotland last year i got some tea from the willow room in edinburgh and that was lovely well you know you got to tea from wherever you can you, know, you might find a find an absolute mumble, but um, yeah, you're right on the PG tip. You can't go wrong. The Yorkshire tea is beautiful. My wife's really into sorts of the kind of herbal stuff, but that doesn't really work for me. Yeah, herbals, herbals, no good. What's that? I, I, good. I, I actually got a triple echo. You what? I got a triple echo. I'm so far behind. I did. That is that is really weird. It's really weird. Why don't you try just for the heck of it? Try putting on if you're do, do your um does your headset have a um have a mic on it? Oh um, no, I'm not that sophisticated. Uh, I mean, these are wireless headphones. I don't know who they are. I would never have a pair of wireless headphones. Um, I don't. I'm not normally in this place. This is my office. But I'm, I'm normally in my studio, and I obviously couldn't get the the picture to work. I've never had a camera working on my. Um, on my on my other iMac, so uh, we'll just make back to this. This is not terrible, is it? No, it's not terrible. It's not bad. As long as the people can hear, hear the pearls of wisdom, we're all right. <laughs> they are pearls. They're always pearls. <laughs> yes, yeah, so so, oh, we've, we've covered we've decaffeinated tea and the politics of Great Britain. So rich. <laughs> at least we didn't get into the politics over here because that no, would we not definitely be clear of that. Let's definitely not go there. No, but no. so, what else? You just had your birthday. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. Yeah. And we and there was a big celebration because of um, Tim Burgess's Twitter listening party because we all got to listen to Heaven or Las Vegas on your birthday. Yeah, that was really sweet the way that worked out because we had um, one of our artists, a uh, um, uh, female artist called Red Harview. Her album was released on my birthday as well, which was special. And then that was all during the day. And then in the evening, um, we did this Heaven or Las Vegas um, listening party, you know, and it was, uh, it was quite a strange, strange phenomenon, really. It's this old Twitter listening party thing. I don't know if you've been following them or anyone who's listening is, has been following them. They're literally uh, saving people's 
Live right now, you know, I mean, that's, that's being strange. But um, people are just really engaging with it. You know, the whole idea of listening to a full album uh, all at the same time. So thousands of people all around the world putting a record on and listening to it from start to finish. It's an unusual thing for people to be doing. People haven't done this for a long time. People stopped listening to albums all the way through, you know, a few years ago. So this is quite unique. And it's sort of, in a way, it's quite analog, even though it's all in this social media world that's online on digital. It is actually quite analog in the way it works. You know, you literally get as many people in a room as possible to either put their vinyl on, their CD on, or stream the record, sit down, look at your Twitter feed, and comment on the record you're listening to, or just listen through to it, and then make some comments at the end. And um, you know, they've had uh, he's had Blur, he's had Oasis, he's had New Order, Franz Ferdinand, Flaming Lips, Chemical Brothers. I mean, you know, the, the most extraordinary list of, of really a, you know, a list uh, artists. Uh, and everyone, all the artists have got an awful lot out of it as well because they are. They are the ones that are tweeting anecdotes, and um, and as you say, I did it with uh, Heaven in Las Vegas um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was actually pretty emotional uh, for me to do that because I hadn't really listened to the record for I don't know maybe twenty years, perhaps all the way through like that, and uh, he'd suggested that I listen through to it the day before. And just sort of rekindle the memories of the recording, and um, you know, write down a few things, a few thoughts, because the the, the the forty minutes goes by super quickly when you're listening and you're sort of typing things out, and then all of a sudden you're being asked questions about song number one, and you're on sort of number three on the record. It's it's hard to keep up because there, there's so much interaction going on. So the more prepared you are, the better he said. And, he was right. I was glad I listened through to it. Um, but yeah, it's been, a, it's been a real phenomenon. The coverage for these parties has, has, has gone out of control. I mean, it's, it's in Rolling Stone, it's in Spin, in the NME, in the Guardian. He's on the BBC talking about it. People really are loving it, you know. Yeah, it's well, what was so cool about it is you didn't have to have a screen. Right. You just yeah. knew you you could you, like you said, you could not. And, and I kind of went back and forth because I feel if some people were listening on a CD. So if you're listening on a CD, it just goes straight through. Right. If you're looking listening on the record, then, you know, you're you're pulling it out of the jacket. You're putting it in. You're flipping it. Oops. You're flipping it over and everything. And yeah. so it's. It, 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 it's, you get a little bit behind and then you're trying to keep up with the comments. And I thought, OK, well, no, I actually just want to lay on the sofa and listen to the record. And then I told you this, my friend Ben Stevens that I used to work with in London, he was listening at the same time and I had no idea because I was tweeting about it. And then he replied to one of my tweets and I thought, what the hell, you know, Ben Stevens, like I hadn't talked to him in years and we're listening to Heaven or Las Vegas at the same time. It was so cool. It is beautiful, you know, bringing people together and uh, when you sort of sit in there and share in the comments and thinking, wow, you know, there's, there's, there might be three, four, five thousand people listening to this right now at exactly the same time. It's very powerful. It's a very powerful feeling, even though we're all apart. Yes. There's something very beautiful about that moment where we're actually all together doing the same thing. There's a few comments here coming in. From yeah, there's lots of comments coming people. in. Um, Darren O'Toole says, thanks so much for bringing this to help you out and stuff. Oh, well, that's our pleasure, of course. Oh, my God. Those uh, are nice to a big fan of your work, blah, blah, blah. Thank you so much. Just here doing my best, guys. Just doing my best. It's all right, which is all you can do. Oh, somebody is um, – Jarleth um, Rice looks like he is – you're now city neighbors. Oh, right. Look, 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 you're in Rottingdean. That's amazing. Well, I'm just up the road in Thorndean. So, uh, yeah, was, we're, we're very lucky to live where we do, I can tell you that. I'm sort of outside of the city and uh, right by the beach. And it's very quiet. Everyone's been pretty well behaved on the whole. Uh, the, uh, the new laws and the social distancing and stuff. So, uh, yes, right, right, we are 
Well, yeah. Are you are you actually able to go to the beach right now, or are your beaches is well, the beach closed? I have a dog, uh, so I'm technically allowed to go and do you know my daily exercise, whatever, uh, with the dog. But I, I did get moved up by the by the police actually the other day because I just took a breather and sat down on the beach through a couple of, through the ball to see you know the dog and. Um, these two police from Catalonia told me I couldn't sit down and I needed to be doing exercise, walking with the dog, which I thought was a bit strange. But I kind of, you know, I, I see what they're saying. Because if other people see me lounging around on the beach, they think, well, if he can do it, why can't I do it? Well, it's fair enough, you know. Uh, you know, I have a one room works for me. Uh, generally, I think people, again, not every room. I saw a photo of the other day, picnic, blankets, and then the you know, badminton. I was like, what are you not doing? I know, it's not a holiday. But, you know, it's I a know, long well, time, time in our history, and I think people are just trying to make the best of it. What was I going to say? The, um, Oh, you know what? Would audio improve if he disconnects and reconnects? I got a text in from Joy Carson. And um, let's do this because I think that it, your audio is it's coming in okay, but it might be, it, it could come in better. I'm wondering if we want to try one more time because your audio at the beginning was perfect. Yeah, you're just like log out. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna quick log you out, and then you can log yourself back in again. All right. Okay, I'll try it one more time. It's gonna be the charm. Okay. Yeah. The other thing that I thought is I could put on a headphone, but you're everybody can hear me okay, yeah? Is is there a problem with my audio? Because if there's a you can comment here. If there's a problem with my audio, then I'll put on my headset. Or maybe I can try. It's so funny, we've been doing this. This is like my ninth one, and we haven't had this amount of audio problems yet. So go figure, we get the musician on and go figure there's an audio issue, right? I think he really wanted to do it out in the, um, oh, yep, okay, we're good. Yeah, I think he wanted to do it out in the studio, but then if when he was in the studio, he didn't have the camera, so he went back into his house. So we're all hanging with, Hyman, with um, Simon at Simon's house. Yep, no problem with me. Um, so yeah, so that's the story with that. But we just roll with it. Thanks for rolling with it. It's not like we're, you know, BBC News or anything. It's just me at my house in Chicago and Simon at Simon's house in Brighton. And we just want to hang out and talk to fans and which is fun. Let's see. Oh, and oh, thanks. So Greg, I, I'm ta I take it because you're J, J Greg Morrison that you're going by Greg, that that's why it's a J. Just Greg. Jazzy Greg. You can figure it out, Greg. Um, have you thought, oh, you know what, Chris, I'll ask him about this when he comes back on. I know that he was writing, he, he was writing and, um, he was working on a biography. And so it's possible that that kind of is on pause because he's been doing the music, the, the second record with Lost Horizons, but I will ask him about that when he comes back on. Um, do, 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 ha, ha, ha. He's probably, you're, I, I don't know if you're ha, ha, just Greg, like just Jack or um, Jazzy Greg, but either way. But we will ask Simon about the, um, the biography when he comes back, and he is coming back right now. Bum, 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 bum. And look, he's got a headset on. Except I'm wondering if we're gonna be able to hear him. Simon, can you talk to us? It's possible that your, that your headset now you can hear me probably, but we can't, you can hear me, but we can't hear you. <laughs> Simon. <laughs> this is, this, this, this is, this is really fun, but this is why, you know, oh, he's reconnecting now. Thanks, Abby. Abby, I am so glad that you're feeling better, by the way. Abby is uh, is Simon's gorgeous wife, and she was sick for a while, and she's feeling better, according to Simon, which I am thrilled for. Um, dun, 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 Nice cap. Nice cap. Oh, here we go. 
Okay, so now, you know what we're going to do? While we're waiting for Simon's audio to get sorted out here a little bit, and we watch him make the funny faces, the funny okay, computer okay, faces. Okay. Working, oh, there we go! How is that? I was going to say, in the comments, you can comment what your favorite, your favorite um, Simon song, record, collaboration, fellow union artist, anything. You can comment your favorites in the feed. Okay, I'm back in the land of the living. Can you hear me, everyone? Oh my God. And it's so much better, Simon. Thank you for doing no that. Idea why. Okay. That's, I cool. don't know. It's, it's, it's a mystery. Good stuff. Um, so one of the things is that one of the questions that came up, they were asking about you writing an autobiography. And as I recall, you have been working on one, but then you kind of put it aside. Yeah. You know, it's a very difficult thing. It's, um, I started it. So I got in, I sort of got into the mood of it about two or three years ago. And I did a lot of writing. I was actually doing some writing for a magazine. Um, and I sort of collected all these kind of short stories. And I was starting to think maybe maybe if I sort of fleshed it all out, it could actually be, become a book. And then I thought, you know, what with my dad's life and all the stuff that I've done with the label and the band and all these anecdotes that I've got from, from sort of 40, 40 years pretty much of doing this, I, I have got a lot to to talk about there's a, there's a lot of interesting things there but it requires a real discipline to uh to write that all down in, in, and get up sort of every morning and do a few hours on your book and i'm, I'm not in that frame of mind right now because i'm so into making my own music i'm really into um writing and recording music right now so the idea of doing that for four or five hours a day maybe more and then doing the book it's just too exhausting um so i'll get around to it one day for sure I mean, I'm amazed. Tim Burgess, who we were just talking about there with his tw tw Twitter listening parties, he, he's written three books. You know, he's younger than I am. Um, but, you know, he's had many, many years of sitting on a tour bus crossing America uh, for months on end, you know, sitting in the back, back of the bus with nothing to do. And that, that's when he's written most of his books is, you know, if you think about that, when you get on the bus at night, and you're driving, you know, maybe 12, 14 hours to the next town for your show the next day, you can't go to sleep, you're buzzing straight after the gig, you know, you don't want to kind of get wasted because those days have long gone. So you, you get out your laptop and you start writing. And um, he, th that's what he told me, you know, he said if it hadn't been for for all that touring on the, on the night bus, um, he probably w wouldn't have been able to get his work done so quick. So I, I said, I'm not beating myself up about it too much. I'll get around to it. Now you're going to, you know, I, I have this thing about perfect timing that like when it's time to write the book, it's time to write the book and then it'll just like, like exactly. that. Hey, um, Greg wants to know about your old studio September sound. All right, Greg. Hey, how are you? Um, wow. Yeah, that is, that's obviously the place where I'm um, having Las Vegas. Well, everything from having Las Vegas onwards was, was made in this place. And, um, it was quite an extraordinary building. It was uh, owned by Pete Townsend from The Who. Um, and in the late 80s, early 90s, he was kind of moving away from wanting to have this big, you know, big commercial recording studio. And he wanted to be more at home doing kind of what I'm doing here now. Uh, he didn't want that pressure of having this sort of, uh, you, you know, worrying about renting the studio out all the time. So it suited us absolutely perfectly because we were looking for a slightly bigger place than we were in. Um, so yeah, we moved in there about uh, six months, eight months before, before Heaven Las Vegas came out. And now uh, it was the most incredible place right on the river Thames, beautiful idyllic spot in the world. We had a massive big thousand square foot balcony right overlooking the Thames, over the Thames um in richmond which is a very sort of posh part of uh, south london and um we all lived around there and the studio was um was an absolute incredible place and we pretty much lived there from i don't know 1989 through to when we left it in about 2001 when the studio went bust um, we couldn't afford to be there because we actually ended up taking over the whole building. Pete stayed in the bottom half of the building for a while. Um, 
and we just rented the top space. But then when he moved out of the bottom space, we took that over as well. And we ran a we ran a 24 track commercial recording studio for other bands like Beth Orton recorded there and uh, Nick Cave and, you know, loads of amazing bands worked there. And we ran that as a commercial studio while we did our own thing upstairs. But it became it became an absolute massive burden um, financially because in those days the rent in that part of the world was was pretty lunatic lunatic numbers you know and um, it was fine when we were getting album advances um, that were significant because we looked at it just like well you know this is what it would cost to make us an this is what it would be cost to make our album if we were to do it somewhere else. So that's how we justified, you know, the high rent. But when we had no band anymore and the band's income wasn't coming in uh, after 1997, um, it, it was really just foolish staying there. But we stayed there right until it went bust and, and then we lost everything. We literally lost every single piece of equipment we ever owned. All our recording gear, all our guitars, keyboards, pianos, we lost the lot. So that was an interesting moment. I was just finishing um, mixing the Lift to Experience album, which is called uh, The Text. Simon, it's okay. As noted, apologies for the technical difficulties. It makes this all the more special. And one of the things that actually came up, oh, here he's back. Don, here he comes, here he comes, here he comes. You know, well, you know what's, you know what, ha we know what's happening, and I don't know if this is true for you in, um, oh, no. in Brighton, but, oh, are you getting an echo again? Are you okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> really, oh, this is just, uh, well, so I'll tell you what, this might actually be to do with. If you have other windows open, or if you have your Facebook window open, maybe you're hearing a triple echo because it's the live stream coming through on your Facebook also. If you have multiple windows open. Please. Da, 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 da. And there he's gone. So one of the things that came up when I was talking to my friend Lottie in Stockholm, she said that because everybody is home now, the amount of bandwidth that everybody is using in Europe is so maxed out she dropped out multiple times and it was because of the uh, bandwidth issue, issue. And she just said, especially in the evenings in Sweden, everybody starts lowering bandwidth that Netflix actually um, started streaming a lesser quality stream, you know, not, not HD anymore because they they needed to, they couldn't support all of their customers. So I'm guessing a similar thing is happening in, um, in the UK, possibly in Brighton. Hey, Simon. Okay. So yeah, I was just saying about the Lift to Experience record. I was producing this record, mixing this record. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in the studio when literally the receivers were, were coming in the very next day, and I had to kind of stay up all night, you know, mixing this record just to get it done. And then you know these guys were coming in, literally taking speakers off the off the top of the desk while I was working, you know. And um, yeah, it was a pretty bizarre time, and we 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 sort of spent twenty years sort of collecting all this equipment and then it was all gone in a matter of in a matter of days but what you know it's quite humbling losing stuff and you, it makes you realize that it is only just stuff uh, um, and as long as you've got your wits about you and you're st still able to be creative then um, and as I realize now I, I don't have really any stuff I just have a computer and a couple of guitars and a piano and um, I just make do with 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 my intuition and uh, just trying to be as creative as possible. It's not it's not about what you own. It's not about how much stuff you've got. It's about what you do with with what you've got. You know. Well, it's a that's totally true. And the other thing is that there's so much. I think people even think about that with with music. I mean, I'm a physical person. I like to have, like, I like to have my record. I've got like my stack of, of Cocteau Twins and, and stuff right over here. But like, I like to have a physical thing, right? I like to have it. But that's not really a mentality anymore because people can just like access whatever music, as much music as they want, just through streaming services. And I suppose there is a, there's an upside and a downside to that. But 
yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, I mean, you know, and I think the great thing is that you can choose. You, you can you can do whatever actually suits your. Once again, the internet. Um, I'm going to pull up some comments. Da 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 da. -da. Thank you, Simon. Yes, the Ohala is amazing. There are so many, there are beautiful guest vocalists on it. And um, it's just, it's it's just gorgeous. It's just a gorgeous record. Yeah, and that's on Spotify. I'm sure it's on Apple Music. It's on, it's on all, it's on all of the, all of the places that you can get streaming. It's a gorgeous record. We're just talking hey, about um, yeah. Ohala and what a gorgeous record it is. Yes, thank you. And there's Simon Thornhill. What a what an absolute gem of a gentleman he is. He's been to many, many Lost Horizon shows. Well, I haven't been that many, but he's been to a lot of them. And a huge Cocteau Twins fan. I mean, going back uh, all the way, and um, an absolute, you know, lovely gentleman, and uh, always very humble and respectful uh, to to all the musicians that he supports. And um, yeah, I mean. We, we we owe huge debts to people like Simon because uh, you know they're the ones that sing and shout about our music when we maybe don't feel that that's quite the sort of thing we should be doing. <laughs> yeah, well, it, what was the last what was the last show that you played with Lost Horizons? Well, it was the very it was the fun, well actually that's a good question. Uh, yeah, what was it? Well, the. The most significant one was the um, the one at Queen Elizabeth Hall, which was um, it was actually at the beginning of the last, of the final tour. Uh, we we did this show where basically everybody, well, everybody bar Karen Paris from the Innocence Mission, um, everybody that sung on the record uh, came and performed. Um, now, for those people that are tuning in that haven't a clue what Lost Horizons is or was or what it's all about. It's basically me and um, a drummer called Richie Thomas from um, a 4AD band called Diff Jazz, beautiful instrumental band who we uh, who we took on tour with us a lot. And um, me and him got together and just basically jammed this record out of nothing. And I took a lot of the stuff we did, improvised, just drums and, and piano and stuff, and brought it back home and created these bits of music and decided to, once they'd reached a certain level, um i would send them out to uh oh thank you babes uh, she says the final show was qeh yeah. so she knows i don't know so um yeah so all these different singers on the record so each track would have a different singer i'd finish it and think well who who would be good to sing on this and i would use my kind of knowledge of new bands and bands that i love voices that i like and um, i've been was hugely fortunate that most people who i asked to sing on the record, uh, all did. And then we did this show. Um, well, I think it was 15 or 16 people on stage in total. So it was a massive logistical uh, undertaking, you know. Um, and actually, well, I enjoyed it, even though, like, those kind of things are normally not particularly enjoyable because you're so sort of wound up by the occasion and wanting it to be perfect. I actually did really enjoy it, and everyone was just so wonderful. Um, people come up from all over America to perform. There are Marissa Nadler and, um, you know, Tim Smith from Midlake. Uh, and he, he hasn't sung live since since 2012, so it felt like uh, just a complete miracle that he um, he turned up. And he, he everyone did such a beautiful job. And I've actually been mixing some of those live tracks. And uh, anyone that's interested can go to the Lost Horizons Bandcamp page. And um, I've been putting them up there for free. Well, well, they're there for people to donate. If they want to spend spend a pound or two or three or five or 20 or whatever, um, the money all goes to um, a food bank down here in Brighton to help during these kind of, you know, peculiarly odd or peculiar times. Um, but, yeah, so that was the last show. And it may well be the last show of Lost Horizons. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I want to do it live again. It's... Um, well, and you're you're in the studio now on the second record, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm just mixing it right now, and it's I could I could finish it tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? It's that close, but um, I'm just um sort of a serial kind of tweaker, you know, and I'm I'm never quite sure if it's just done yet. It's nearly done, but it's not quite done. I think I'll know when it is. So what I do is I kind of do the mix all day, and then I come back and fiddle with it a bit more the next day, and then I 
going to sit in the bath and um, I listen to it on my headphones and I listen to it in a sort of different environment with, with headphones on rather than in my studio where it sounds amazing. And then I think, okay, this is what most people will be listening to it sounding like, you know, and it's not quite right yet. And then I'll go and listen to it in my car because my car system I know very, very well. And, you know, if it sounds good in the car, you know it's going to sound good. So um, that's how I sort of switch between finding out what, whether it sounds good on one system or another and then working out what I need to do, go back and make a tiny little adjustment to the keyboard or the bass or whatever it is. So I'm in that process, but I, mean, I would say it's 90, 90% done. So are any of the voices from the first record on the second record as well, or did you find all new vocalists? Um, no, there are some there are some names that um, that were on the first record. I mean, I I, I I did I did think about going completely you know uh, new on it and just trying completely different people, but you know sometimes you finish a piece of music and the person who comes into your mind if they're if they're on the last record or not they're, they're still the person that's that you feel is the right singer it's, it's all about who's the right singer not really who they are do you know what i mean it's um and and i'm so in love with tim smith and karen paris and they are both on the record again i think their voices are so extraordinary and their their appearances on other things are quite rare so i, I sort of feel um quite honored and privileged that that they are on my record you know because karen's never sung on anyone else's record apart from from her own so that feels special and she is one of my favorite singers of all time um you yeah, know she, there's something the about Karen her, Paris, her you know. voice yeah she's just it's it's like it's you know it's kind of like it's it's like a liz fraser kind of thing like there's yeah, there's something about the unique. quality of her voice that's just galactic you know yeah, I don't. I mean, I've no idea how she sings like she does. It's um, it's sort of, it's not childlike exactly, but it's got this sort of strange tone to it that's just seems so. Her words are so wise and and meaningful and and poignant, even though, just on the face of it, the sort of the actual words she's using are just generally just simple. But the way she puts them together in in a in a lyric is is I think quite profound, and and very moving, and um, I mean the album that's the Innocence Mission release called The Birds of My Neighborhood. Um, if 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 you have never heard that record, that that is something you guys need to resolve immediately. This is just one of the most beautiful pieces of music. Um, it's very, it's very, very sad, and it's very melancholic. I'm sure there's something pretty heavy has gone on prior to the making of that record. But you know, often, you know, grief and um, um, you know uh, things going wrong in one's life can be uh, can help the creation of a really important record. And so, anyway, yeah, she's on it, and Tim Smith from Midlake again, um, one of my favourite singers of all time. So I'm very, very lucky. And then there are some other beautiful people on the record too. And I should probably shouldn't just give you a giveaway too much. No, don't give away too much. That's okay. Don't get, you don't have to give it away. But I, it, your point about the um, having something happen in your life, be a sort of a catalyst or just shape what you're working on artistically is, is an interesting point. I mean, it came up when on the, on the Twitter listening party with heaven or Las Vegas. And it also came up with just going, you know, going into the studio with lost horizons, because if you remember, I'm wearing my, um, I'm wearing my, uh, my Bowie shirt. Ta -da! Good choice. But, um, remember that, that we were talking about this in France, that you were going into the studio and it was the morning. It was that Monday after Bowie had died. And you were like, we have to, we have to make well, that's this. Right. We have to make I didn't this. really want to go in. And the, the, you know, the story was we, we only took very few days, very few days on that record. We actually were together, me and Richie, um, because we, we, because I was, I'm a really busy person. You know, I, I don't have an awful lot of time just to sort of go in studio for two or three weeks on end and just be self-indulgent and selfish. I'm, I, I have to sort of grab a few days here and there. And that's, quite hard to do because you're trying to sort of cram all this stuff in but we booked four days in the studio and uh and and, and then we got the news in the in, in the morning or, or late last late night when uh when bowie died and um 
I was really sad about it, you know, as, as you know, the whole net, the whole world was. Um, and I just wasn't really feeling in a particularly creative mood. And uh, I just thought, I, I can't go in. I can't go in the studio and start making music today. It just feels wrong. And I called Richie and said, should we just like knock it on the head and do it some other day? And he was, he and a massive fan as well. So he was guided and, uh, as well. But he said, you know, no, man, we, we got to go in. We have to go in and we have to use the energy. He, he, he would want us to do that. We should go in and use the energy um, and, 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 you know, give him something to be proud of. And it, Richie is very straightforward and to the point. You know, he just says exactly the, what's needed to be said at the right time. And um, I overthink everything. And he, he just said that. And I was like, yeah, you know, actually, that's, that's the right way to look at it. So we went in and we, we wrote this piece of music. Um, which I didn't really th think about it at the time because we just did it and it felt really beautiful just to be making music that day. But then once I got home and listened back to it, I was like, wow, you know, that that could have been on low or something. That that record, that song, it's cool. We, we've released it. It's on a on a little CD. Uh, it's, it's online on Spotify. It's called On The Day You Died. It's not on the album um, because it was an instrumental piece with saxophone and, and obviously Bowie uses a lot of saxophone and Richie's an amazing saxophone player. He plays on a lot of the early Cocteau Twins records. He played on Victoria Land and he played on the Harold Budd album. Um, so Richie and I go back an awful long way and he wasn't into playing sax much on the, on the Lost Horizons record because he hadn't been practicing for years and he was like, oh, I'm really rusty. And I was like, come on, man, you just got to play sax on this piece because it was just a piano thing. And, and he got his saxophone out and it was beautiful. And he thought it was awful and he he was like no you you have to delete that and i was like you're joking right that is one of the most beautiful sax parts i've ever heard and he was like no it's awful like, I, i'll redo it next week and i was like no you won't and i never let him redo it i just kept it and he grew to like it i think so um yes that's right simon thornhill it is on the brighton ep that's exactly what it's called <laughs> thank you for telling me my own <laughs> Yeah. See, you've um, got you've got your your you've got Abby and you've got your fans to yeah. bring Where in would all I be the, without the, you guys? The, data, the data. Exactly. But so then has this like kind of odd time has that had an influence on how you're listening to the next record then? Like is it in, do you do you feel like this container that we're in is influencing you? I swing a little bit both ways with it. I think about two or three weeks ago, um, when this all was sort of kicking off, I was really into the mixing. Um, I was, you know, in there all the time, um, and I was really in the zone. Because the thing, the thing that, that um, maybe people watching who don't make music won't perhaps totally understand is that when you're creating, you're writing a tune or you're improvising and you're in the studio and you pick up a guitar, and it's all great fun and it's all like very in intuitive for me anyway and it's it's super creative. It's the best, the best of times is when you're recording and writing. Um, for me, the two things are done at the same time. That's not for everyone, but that's how I do it. Um, and I love that and I, I can't get enough of it when I'm doing it. Um, mixing is like it's it's like a com it's like science and religion. You know they 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 don't they don't really compute. They don't relate. Um, and and mixing is very much the scientific part. Of it. It's it's very mathematical. And I'm not that guy. It, you know I I'm, I just want to do something and go off and do something else. I'm not patient. And mixing you need just so much patience and you need so much focus and you need to really sort of get inside the song and inside each sound and try and work out what it is that you need to do to make it better and you've got to listen to it in a completely different way than just hey this is a cool piece i'm really gonna love in this guitar part it's got nothing to do with that anymore it's it's right at the other end of the spectrum and it's not something i was even sure i could do because I didn't mix the last record, I um, I had someone else do that because I, I felt I was just too close to it. But this time I thought, I have to do it because no one else is going to know what's really truly in my head of how these songs should sound. Um, so I made the decision, I have to do it and I have to get into that mindset. I have to force myself to mix this record and, and be a scientist. 
Um, so three or four weeks ago, I was really loving it and I was totally in the zone. And then I kind of had a few do few days off and when all this was really kicking off and um, I just, I, I think maybe it's just the general anxiety of this virus. And Abby was really not well, uh, really, really not so well. And that was playing on my mind. And then you got, I've got the dog to look after and a couple of walks every day. And, you know, our dog walker wasn't doing any walks. So, uh, you know, there's, there's that to consider and cooking the food and getting shopping in and, you know, mixing a record just seemed like I, I haven't got time to be mixing a record. I've got to keep the house tidy and um, do other things that are actually much more important right now. So I've gotten out of the zone and I'm trying hard to get back into it at the moment. And, um, you know, God, God willing, I will soon. Well, as, as you said, you've only got, you, you said you're what, 90% there. Yeah. So mm. just another 10%. It's always, but isn't it true that it's always that last 10%. I have a visitor, by the way, speaking of dogs. Oh, this is, this is, um, this is Frenchie. Oh, what kind of a doggy is that? Um, you know, a troublemaking kind of dog. No, she's great. She's a, uh, she's a, she's a mix. She's like a terrier chihuahua ish mix. Oh, uh, I don't know where my dog is probably up on the bed with Abby first asleep. I should think. Well, that's, that's the soft place to be right. They just want to, they just want a soft, warm place to, yeah. to, to snuggle yeah, in. So it's always good to have a dog around. But, so what what do you think is the what what do you think will be like the motivator to click you back in to finish that last ten percent? Because I know based on what everybody is saying here in the feed, they they they're 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 gagging for the uh, the, the second record. Well, believe me, I really want to get it done too. But it's it's got to be right, you know. Um, and what what is also what is also causing me some anxiety is which tracks I don't put on the record. Um, and on the last record, the last. And there we go. Now we, we need to find out how many, first of all, I want to find out how many tracks he has on this record and how many, and actually I'm going to also ask to see um, if there's other, if there's like a bunch of other streaming going on and probably not, it's probably just Abby watching Simon on Facebook live upstairs and that shouldn't do anything right here. He's coming back. We're going to find out how many tracks and, and how, and how many. So, so, so Simon, how, how many tracks do you have on the record and how many, how many do you uh, think you're going to have to leave off? Can't you just, just do a double or a triple record? Gatefold. Uh, I had the exact same scenario which drove me literally almost crazy. I very likely was only days away from being ad admitted to a mental home. Um, it's, it's it's stressful getting kind of a track listing. Most musicians who, who are putting an album together will tell you the track listing is always quite hard because you've got to work out you, you know the order and the flow and whether you're doing it like an old-fashioned vinyl record of you know, five songs on one side, five on the other, and how do you make that flow and tell a story and all that kind of stuff. On the first record I had, um, I think I had 19 tracks finished. And um, I said, well, well, there's no possible way I can put out a, an album of like an hour and whatever it was, 25 minutes, as my first, as our first record ever, because people would just not listen to it. It's too long. Um, but then the more I thought about it, I was like, but I mean, I just really love it all. I don't, I don't want to leave tracks off. Um, and I, if anyone can be self-indulgent right now, after all the stuff I've been through in my life, having not, not really made music for so long and finally found something that I really love doing and a person I really love doing it with, if I can't be self-indulgent and selfish, then there's something wrong. So then I swung the other way again. I'd go, no, that's stupid. That's just shooting yourself in the foot. And it was just a whole mental sort of table tennis thing going on. And I could not make my mind up. Um, and I got some different piece of advice from people that I work with. What do you think about? Oh, I think you should have them all on there. Or I think you should only have 10. And it really wasn't helping because, you know, I was getting too many opinions that were the same as my own. Um, in the end, I kind of, I compromised and had a, a few tracks off, which ended up on that Brighton EP that we were talking about before, and 15 are on the album. So it's still a long record, and maybe it's maybe it's too long. 
so this time I was like, I'm definitely not going to make that mistake again. I'm only going to do 10 tracks and then I'm going to stop. Just like the Cocteaus, in the Cocteaus days, we, we recorded 10 pieces of music. Liz came in and sung on those 10 pieces of music and then we all went home. And that was the album. We didn't have any spare tracks. We didn't have any unfinished tracks. It was all, that 10 is the record. Then if we had to make B-sides, well, then we'd go back in the studio and write some B-sides. And if, if they ended up being better than the album tracks, well, then, you know, hard luck. This time, I thought that's what I would do, but I didn't. I just ended up carrying on recording and having fun being creative and completely forgot about the fact that I should be restricting myself to 10. <laughs> so now I've got 18 tracks again. Um, so well, I... I I really have you no could you could you could, like yeah. Simon made the comment that you know that's what God made EPs for you know so <laughs> I mean you could you could do go the EP route you could have two different albums or you could just be entirely ruthless just 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 be ruthless all of those things are, are definitely possible I've thought about them all of course um but that still doesn't make the final decision any easier because no the, the thing is, this time, though, there are a couple of tracks I, I don't think um, quite quite make the grade at the moment, uh, whereas on the last track, so I, I've probably got about 16 to choose from, um, which is which is better than, you know, 18 or 19 or whatever it is. Um, but I am really in love with most of those, so we shall see. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it, because who's going to put a record? I'm not going to put a record out now. What's the point? No, you know, the, people have got much too much going on in their lives i'm, I'm gonna wait a while uh, wait till I, next I, year. I do like the notion of putting out a song here or there we actually for for pravda had a record released on march 20th and you know that had that date any any date up until now had been set long ago so yeah. you know that like <clears throat> this 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 skid this massive skid of vinyl showed up at our front doorstep and i mean it was like this bright ray of sunshine that this record showed up it was the new matt wilson record and it was glorious and then the record release show obviously had to be canceled so that ended up being on you on a live stream on youtube at that point, people could still kind of congregate if they were far enough apart. Now nobody can do it, so no bands can really play together anymore. You yeah, know, it has to be like you got, a, you got a thousand boxes of records stuck in your house. You know, you, that's not what I want right now. Um, no, it's a, it's a real conundrum because I mean, on the one hand, you you could you could say it's actually a great time to put a record out as long as you're not too bothered about um, numbers and chart sales and you know who buys it and who doesn't because people really love listening to music right now it's obviously there's not much else to do listen to music watch netflix um go for a walk go in the garden read a book um you know eat and go to sleep there's that you know there's, there's li limited things that one can do in the house um music obviously something that people are still voraciously consuming um but the retail aspect of it is worrying for all of us in the music business there's no doubt about yeah. that well, that's the thing. You 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 can't just think like you know. You can't just think like the artist. You're thinking like the artist, and you're also thinking like the label at the same time. You, you can't separate yeah. the two, right? Yeah, that's that's hard. I mean, I think I'll always be the musician first and the label guy the second. Um, so I tend to think of things mostly from an artist's viewpoint first. But you know, right now, it, it, because the business side is is so tricky um and everyone is so worried about it and I'm, i've got obviously a huge amount of my friends are in uh, independent record shops um and it is their livelihood and i i fear for, i fear for them you know um and i fear for the bands you know because the bands haven't played shows for it might only be three or four weeks but you know, you forget about like all the promoters and the booking agents and the crew people and the sound engineers and the people that work at the bars and the venues, you know, everyone is, and I know our, our industry is no different to anyone else's. Um, it's all, it's all a mess, but it's, it's particularly sad when you know a lot of these people and they're all self-employed and they all just about scrape through when there is a lot of work on. So God only knows how people are going to survive right now because, um, this could this could drag on for the rest of this year you know it could yeah are are they um 
are they saying for you all in Brighton how long the quarantine is going to last? Are like they giving you dates? Uh, I haven't. I can't remember what they are. I think it was initially it was uh, until the end of April, but that got extended. I think to maybe the end of May or something. I don't really pay attention to the news and the media anymore. I just stop stop looking at it. I'm just looking at Twitter listening parties and emails about Bella Union and making music and watching MasterChef with Abby. That's you know that's the best we can do. If I'm on me, if I'm looking at the the news all day, then my levels of anxiety are just are just going to go too high. I need to keep my blood pressure down, not make it worse no you got to keep it down i know in the states i think i don't know if it's in the states or if it's globally but it's like anti-anxiety meds it's like 30 percent. it's going through the rough going through yeah the rough. Well, no, me and abby were just talking about talking about this to, to... and there he goes nick i know lots of people want to ask about um if he's still in contact with robin and liz so we will ask him when he comes back in i also after i ask him the question about robin and liz i am also going to ask him if he ever gets tired of talking about the Cocteau twins. You know, if, if, if the Cocteaus are like, it, because he talks about them so much, that's, that, that, that's actually my question for him. Um, hey, I don't know if you can hear me when I, when, when you're, I, when you're I, not I, there, I, I, I keep talking, I keep but talking I, about I, you while you're gone. I saw the, I saw the, the, the text from Nick um, about Robin and Liz, which I'll get back to in a second, but I was just going to say about, um, I'd be interested to know what people think about this because me and Abby, Abby were talking about it um, before dinner and uh, we were both saying how our, our sleep has, has been terrible in the last few weeks, just really unbroken, um, um, broken, you know, night sleep, uh, rest, restlessness and, and not, we're, we're both normally, once we go to sleep, you know, generally pretty much sleep until morning but um neither of us have been able to get to sleep till really late and waking up a lot during the night terrible dreams i'm wondering if this is like it's related to this just because i you know I, I don't think I, i'm certainly not a pessimistic person in general i'm super optimistic and i s just deal with things as they come along and i don't get too too up when things are great and i don't get too down when things are bad I tend to try and keep very even on, on the whole um, but I'm just wondering if, if sort of subconsciously we are all really actually quite generally worried about this stuff and the, uh, whether we're just putting on a brave face and whether the anxiety is what's, is what's affecting our, um, internal organs and, um, ability to sleep. I just can't go to sleep. And that might be because I'm watching too much, you know, too many thrillers to try and take my mind off the, the virus. It's well, yeah, I know that one of the first things we watched when it started to get bad was Knives Out because it's, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's, it, did you see Knives Out? It's Dan, yeah, Daniel right, Craig. It's, right, yeah, right, it's, yeah. It's, it's great, but you're like, okay, who did it in this? And you're trying, you're trying to track all the things and, and that helped. I, I know myself, I've been sleeping a lot more. It's like my, it's almost like, like my system has to metabolize things and it's in the metabolizing it. And then I, then you wake up again and it's kind of this energetically there's there, there can be a groundhog day feeling about it, about things. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm going through right now. Um, but you know, no, nothing stays the same, does it? It's the, there's change always is on the horizon and everything in every day we, we, we get through. Um, and while we might be thinking this, wow, when is this ever going to end? It, it will. And hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later. And that's why I try, I try not to read the stuff because if you sort of read it one day, you'd think, Oh my God, th th I'm not, I'm never going up. There's not going to be any shows until next Christmas. You know, whereas we don't really know any of this stuff. This is just complete hearsay. This is people, you know, I always sort of feel I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I always feel that the extreme view is going to be the one that gets the most coverage on, on platforms like, like 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 Twitter and Facebook, because it gets the most attention because it's contentious and the same, so literally outlandish gets credence and people start saying you know well they're everyone's saying that we're not going there's not going to be shows till till next Christmas, <laughs> whereas you know it, it, we don't know any of this stuff at the minute. Um, it, it could it could be over uh, quicker than we than we think.
Um, but let's live each day as it comes and just be prepared for uh, for sticking it out a bit longer. I mean, it's only been a few weeks. And there he goes. He'll be back. As you know, he just keeps clicking back in and clicking back off. Um, one of the things that I know that's been saving me, aside from, you know, Frenchie, who's on my lap, is uh, a sense of humor. I think we're coming up with all sorts of fun band names, like potential new band names and potential new songs or album, album, album. I was talking about Simon um, having a sense of humor about things. So Kenny and I came up, I want, I want to have a new band called Uncertain Times, These Uncertain Times. And I want our first record to be called Pandemic Sex Tape. So I'm wondering if like, if you'll put out the new Bella Union can be our label, we can put out um, these uncertain times can put out our pandemic sex tape. What do you think? I, I could say I probably not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's unlikely. It's unlikely. But uh, it's highly it's unlikely. Moment, so I would say, suggest Bandcamp is your, well, you've got your own record label. What do you need mine for? <laughs> Oh, man, that's oh gosh well um hey did you want did you want to talk about um the robin and liz thing and my question for you is do you get sick about talking do you get sick of talking about cocteau twins or no no i mean you you not no you you, you sort of you get there's, well, there's waves where you sort of think oh you know is this interview you know just going to be predominantly about the past because i'm I'm not somebody that lives in the past you know i'm somebody that lives very much in in today and um but i'm also very aware of my past and that i wouldn't be here without it and that, that that's something you always have to be respectful for plus i think we 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 for a period of time there we we made some amazing music together and for a certain period, um, I think the stuff that Robin and, and I did in the studio together and that Liz then came in and just, you know, blew everyone's mind with what she did. There was a period of time there where I think we were really on our A game, you know, and, and creating stuff that was unlike anything else that, that maybe had come before. It felt like it anyway. Um, we would never have said that to each other, but looking back at it now, I sort of feel like it was a very, very special time. Um, so I never take that for granted, and I never mind talking to. I never, I never mind talking about it. Um, obviously, some of the personal stuff I tend tend to kind of not uh, delve too deep with it, even though you know you go online, you, you can find it all there. It, it's all there, um, it's and it's. There. It's all there, <laughs> you know. The drugs, the breakups, the the you know the relationship problems. The, um, it, it, it's all very well documented. You know, we, we I don't need to go into it, and it's it's really not that interesting because what band didn't have drug problems and drink problems and relationship problems? You know, Fleetwood Mac. You know, everybody did, um, and it's nothing particularly interesting. And drugs are so uninteresting to me um, that. You know, I tend to sort of just skirt over that period um, entirely. And yes, Robin had a, had a massive problem with it, and and that was very sad for him. Um, but he, you know, he overcame it, and uh, you know, congratulations to him. And in, 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 you know, he 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 found love with a, a a French girl, and they got married, and he moved over to France, and he lives his life. Um, Elizabeth is in Bristol doing her own thing and living her life. Um, and I am in, in, in contact with her quite a bit. I speak to her, um, every now and then, and we see each other at shows. Um, and she, she's, she's unofficially managed by one of my very great friends. Um, so, you know, we're in the same conversations a lot and she sent me an absolutely lovely text on my birthday and yeah you know we we keep in close contact i absolutely adore elizabeth robin and i not so close um you know physically certainly not close because he's in a different different country um but you know i have the utmost respect for that guy uh, as a as a musician uh, an absolute pioneer um an innovator um and you can't you can't argue with that what he crew what he was part of in the in the Cox twins is 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 given a lot of pleasure to a lot of people and you know i'm very proud to have been able to work with him yeah well and it and it's interesting now looking at the roster of artists that are on bella union 
and 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 the cure i'm curious about your curation process because um i don't know if it's just i make it up in my head that i that i hear something that sounds like they could all be from all of the artists have some kind of spaciousness or some kind of something about them that can kind of connect to the dna of your of the sounds that you've created your entire career i don't know if i make that up or if that's actually true I don't know. Is the is the is the truthful answer is I um I don't know. I suppose I'm too close to it. Um, I think if you look at the artists on the roster, you know, and the, the, there's there's probably almost too many to keep up with. Sometimes I, I, people do say that that we release a lot of records, usually a couple a month, and I try to keep a balance between you know the older established artists um, like Spiritualized, Mercury, Flaming Lips, John Grant. Beach House, Ezra Furman, Jonathan Wilson, some of the sort of more established older artists and always trying to bring through the kind of next breed of, of, of artists, uh, of newer artists, younger bands and like Pompoco or Penelope Isles or, or Drab City or whoever it is. I'm, I'm, I'm just as interested, excited about like hearing a, ba a, ba a band that, that literally no one's ever heard of before that have no views, no likes, I love that stuff just as I, I, as much as I love the more established, older artists. Um, so I'm sort of I'm pretty lucky to have the balance of the two. Quite how it all ties together sonically, I haven't got a clue. Uh, not sure it does. I think the only common thread really is just me is me, and and I like such an extreme array of music. Thankfully um that i'm trying to kind of make the the label as broad a spectrum of music as possible you know we've got classical artists we've got uh, soundtracks we've got you know noise metal kind of bands like jambinai from korea we've got um sort of art folk artists like like laura veers we've got like uh, congolese artists like Belogi. we've got instrumental bands we've got electronic stuff like i break horses you know, lots of different stuff that I don't think necessarily does have that kind of, you know, ethereal Cocteau twinsy sort of thing about it. Um, but maybe if you look at the more successful things, they perhaps do have a thread. I mean, at one point people would say, oh, Bella Union, that's the kind of folky, that's the kind of folky Americana label, isn't it? Well, no, it wasn't. It's just that the bands that were really huge, like, you know, Fleet Foxes and stuff. Well, that's the sound that they were making. Yeah. Um, so people tend to kind of, you know, just sort of say, oh, well, you're that, because that, that's the most successful thing you have. Midlake, you know, Americana, folky, Fleet Foxes, Americana, folky. And I'd be like, yeah, but what about all this other stuff? You, you know, you'd, 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 you would say it was a different sounding label if you knew some of the other bands, but you just don't happen to know them. Um, right. And that, that's just the way it is. I don't expect people to check every single ban on the label out. It, it, you'd be, you'd be hard pressed to, to, to be able to have the time to do that. I, I barely do. Um, well, it's, I, I love that the, what we were talking about before we actually went live, the treasure trove that you're posting every day, like a different artist, a different song. Yeah, and I, I think that, that be, yeah, I thought that would be a nice way of sort of, delving back into the catalogue and whether it whether it's recent past to you know current or or back 23 years i thought it'd be interesting for me as well um and also maybe just to sort of give p people a chance to kind of rediscover something or discover something that they were um, previously unaware of because there's so much music out there that, that we we never get a chance to hear and i you know i think it's important to keep putting things in front of people and challenging them to listen to it because as we've seen with these listening parties it's unusual for people to sit and listen to a record anymore and i'd, I'd like that to change i don't think it yeah. will but i'd like it to <laughs> well it's, it's, it's asked it's, me if um there's any chance of liz guesting on the next lost horizons album well nick reynolds i would love that more than oh, i can yeah. tell you um and I have, I have, I have, I have sent her a piece of music, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it wasn't quite right for her, because I haven't, I haven't heard back. But um, usually, when you don't hear back, it's, it's, 
generally because the answer is probably no, but they don't want to sort of say no. Um, and anyway, it probably is too late now because I've <laughs> already got 18 tracks. I don't need any more. But uh, yeah, gee, Liz Fraser on a Lost Trans record. What a, what a dream that would be. But um, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can't have everything we want, can we? No, but you you could do just a side project. You could just do another side project with her. <laughs> I'd love it, but you know what? I have no expectation about that, and I think in a way, I could, if I was Liz, I wouldn't do it either. You know, I think it's it's quite painful. It's a lot more painful for her than it is for me to delve back into Cocteau Twins world. Because remember, I was you know I joined the band. A bit later later i joined the band two, two years after they formed late 83 early 84 so uh, although i was i was there through till 97 you know and, and um significant part of the band i still was like the new boy for a long time but you know liz was in the band from the beginning and her and robin were a couple from the beginning right through till you know whatever it was 94 when uh, 93 when they when they broke up um and one cannot one cannot put oneself in her in her shoes about how how that must have been to deal with with all of that stuff going on. And once she was out of it and able to get on with her life and live it in her own way, why would you want to why would you want to go back and even dip your toe in and, and work with even one of the people in the band because it would just bring bring back all these memories. Yeah. And uh, not all good, so uh, that certainly stops me from the uh, entertaining the idea of reunions, which I get asked about literally every day. Um, and I totally get it. If I was a Quartz of Twins fan and I hadn't had the opportunity to see the band play live, I'd be like, "Oh man, if only that band would reform." Yeah, Talking Heads would be cool, but Quartz of Twins that would be amazing. But I mean. It would just be so fake, you know. There would there would be no joy in it um, from anybody's side, and I'm I'm not doesn't doesn't make me feel good to say that, but I I just think we're all so into our own thing right now, and the drama of being in the Cocteau Twins uh, sort of um, how do I put it succinctly enough. Yeah, the, the drama of being in the band sort of sw swamped us. You know, it, it stopped us, stultified us, stopped us being able to be creative because everything else took over. The music was like, just, it, it wasn't possible to make the music anymore because of the drama. There was always drama, but the music was a, was a beautiful, beautiful release from the drama. But when the drama sort of overtook the music to the point there was no time to do the music, yeah. You have well, to say, and when you think about how, how music impacts us physically, just the, and it's, it, even just doing the Twitter listening parties, it's, it's odd, the emotions or the memories that just get triggered. It could, it could not even necessarily be a song. It could be a chord. It could be just these moments that come through you. So I can't imagine if that's how it is for a fan or a listener, I can't even imagine how it would be for the singer whose body, is, her body is the instrument, right? It's Yeah, I can see it being, you know, nigh on impossible. I mean, you can never, never, you can never say 100% never because you just never really truly know. And there was a moment where we did all get in a room many, many, many years later after the band broke up, maybe uh, 10 years after, um, where, we'd, where we'd, we'd all said no, never. And then we, we, we did all get back in a room and we were all considering it for a short we while. And it didn't happen, but, um, you know, I never thought we'd even get to that stage where we would all sit down together and, and discuss it. Um, and it seemed like, ah, it could actually work. So, I mean, I mean, it's, it's stupid to say it 100% will never happen. I would say it would 99.9% .9 will never happen. But as long as there's a percentage there, I suppose that, you know, the hardcore fans will always hold on to that. And if, I, I would too. Um but you know, a Liz Fraser solo record would be would be something that I would be very happy with if that could ever happen. And you know, who knows that 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 would probably be a more likely event than a quarter to a three union. Well, and earlier in the feed, earlier in the thread, I don't know if you saw that people were asking for a 
a Simon, a Simon solo release. I no, the, the sort of lost. I, I kind of look at Lost Horizons as to like my closest, my closest, uh, you know, avenue to do, doing something solo. This, I mean, Abby, will, will, I'm sure she likes hearing my singing voice, and maybe some of my, maybe my brother would, or some of my very close friends might be very nice and say, "Oh no, you, you you've got a lovely voice." But I, I'm not, I'm not a fan of my own voice, so I think um, it's unlikely that I would have the um, confidence to go there because it took me a long while to get the confidence just to go back in the studio and make music and be proud of it and um, feel confident enough that I was able to do it. It took me pretty much 20 years, you know. So uh, it might take me another 20 to drum up the courage to sing. Well, yeah. well, we'll be here. We'll be here. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. that's, that's, I'll be that's, here. Yeah. Well, my voice is a little bit... It'll be distorted, but I'll do my best. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be fine. You just have to keep, 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 keep them, keep, keep hydrated with your tea. Not, you know. Yeah, as long as I keep my own teeth. Yeah, keep your own teeth and drink your own tea. Exactly. Uh, it was, oh my gosh, um, for those of you who don't know Penelope Isles, though, you mentioned when you were talking about some of the newer artists, they, not only are they a fabulous band, they were so lovely. Oh my gosh, it was so fun to have them in Chicago. It, yeah, they like they, amazing, amazing bunch. For, for those of you that are in Chicago, they played the bottle and um, half the band <laughs> came and stayed at our house and it, it, they just, it was such, it was such a blast. I, we loved, we loved them. We are all the me and Abby managed them as well. So we are sort of kind of part of their family. We really miss them right now because they're, uh, they're away in Cornwall making, uh, making their new album or writing songs for their new album. I tell you what, I must just ask, answer some of these questions. Oh yeah. Um, Frank, how, how is he? Hi, Frank. Um, there was talk of a live Dirty Three album. Is that still on? Yes, there is. Yes, yes, it is still on. I can't really reveal all, um, but very soon, hopefully, something all will become clear. But um, yeah, something very special is being put together on that front. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, Diff Joe's reforming. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a thing? Uh, I'd be the front of the queue for that. I'd be down the front of every of every single show. But I mean, again, that's a slightly different. Well, obviously, completely different scenario. But I mean, uh, nobody knows where the two of the core members of that band are. No, no, literally nobody. You know how like what was that thing that was an app maybe like twenty years ago called Friendster. Yep. Remember that? Where yeah. you could sort of like go on and you could find your old school chum, you know, and, and sort of all of a sudden people that had disappeared from your life, you know, you could reconnect with them again. MySpace was a bit like that as well for a while. And it, it's very hard right now with this digital age to be, to disappear, is it not? It's but, pretty uh, hard. Yeah, I, and I mean, literally, Richie and me and all, all of my friends from that period, 1980s, have been unable to contact, get any contact address, email, phone number, text number, Facebook page, nothing for the two brothers, Dave and Alan Curtis, that were in Diff Chairs. Even the record label who have royalties for them, even 4AD who have royalties for them, have I just keep, just keep getting their um, envelopes returned. They, they don't have any up-to-date information for them. So there's money like not being claimed and has been for years. And it's a bit like there needs to be a sort of, you know, missing persons documentary made about well, what have happened to those two guys? You know, I keep thinking, well, I, I'll find them eventually. You just Google search and you get to page 133 and then you'll find something, but no, nothing. So that is, that is, odd. Is, is, is just unlikely because two of the members of the band don't seem to be on the planet Earth, I'm afraid to say. Uh, what else we got here? There's a, um, there's a question about Vaughn Oliver. Oh, uh, yeah, I was at his funeral. Um, how much of a loss has Vaughn Oliver been to cover design? Oh my gosh, the the biggest. I mean, obviously, you know, he he wasn't making so much um, album artwork in the last year or last years year or two. Uh, doing, you know, a lot of uh, lecturing and you know, teaching at Epsom College. Well, I can only imagine what an amazing teacher he must have been. 
uh, yeah, that was an incredibly sad day. Um, but the funeral was beautiful. Uh, every, you know, everyone you would hope to have been there was there. They could, they actually couldn't fit everybody in the crematorium. There was that that many people turned up. So that was beautiful, and it was amazing to see his kids. Well, his sons are not kids anymore; they're men, um, and his wife. Uh, yeah, I miss him. He's an incredible talent, a uh, funny, funny guy. Uh, you often never really were sure if he was taking the piss or whether he was being serious. He had an amazing kind of geordy sense of humor. Um, <clears throat> and one of the most extraordinary visual artists of the last 50 years, for sure. As influential as Peter, as, um, Peter Saville, as far as record design goes, there's no, there's no doubt about that. He might get less plaudits um, and certainly not as many T-shirts as as... Peter Savile's designs have spawned, but um, his artwork was absolutely, it influenced way more than just record design. It influenced book literature, book art, um, graphic art in general, just in the way that ha that handwritten style were, were sort of suddenly started coming back in soon after he was using it. Um, yeah, amazing man. Thank you for that question. What other um, visual artists right now are um, are calling to you? Like because I know that 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 cinema and 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 yeah. film they are very inspiring to you as well. Like what's 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 inspiring you that way? Well, I tell you what, I've been obsessed with um, since probably just within the last twenty four hours. If if you look at my Google search within the last twenty four hours, um, it might you might wonder if I had an, uh, some kind of strange obsession with this gentleman but there's a photographer <clears throat> that abby and i um stumbled across last night when we were watching well, maybe it was the night before we were watching um a really interesting documentary on the bbc about uh image and there was this french photographer that um took his first first photograph when he was seven uh, he died in 1987 so he you know he he took pictures throughout the first throughout the first second world war throughout the 50s and 60s uh, he's a french photographer called la tigue um l-a-r-t-i-g-u-e um and i'm literally obsessed with the guy's photography i've been trying to buy a print of this one image that we saw of this woman on it he, he was obsessed with because obviously you know ca 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 cameras were very basic back then and uh, he was doing things that that really no one had ever done before um and, and capturing sort of motion uh, in in such a beautiful and expressive way and uh, there's a particular picture um you can you can find it online there's quite a lot of uh, of pictures of, of of women on on beaches with with dogs but there's this one particular picture of this woman she's kind of like she's like a ballet dancer she's sort of in the midair kind of running along the beach and the dog the dog which is a really gorgeous looking dog um i can't work out what kind of breed it is but it, it's sort of uh it's, it looks a bit like a kind of weimarana but it, it's got spots and it's a gorgeous looking animal and it's it's also in mid-flight and it, it's the photograph is sort of from back here and, and they're coming towards the camera. I mean, I've God knows how he got that shot with whatever camera he was using. Um, Lartigue, that's L-A-R-T-I-G-U-E. Um, Jean, Jean something. Uh, he begins with H, the second part of it, but um, it, it, yeah. it's Lartigue oh. is the sound. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So that's what I'm obsessed with. I'm thinking... That's what I'd like on the cover of my next record, but you know they're, they're like ten thousand pounds for a, for a print, so I think it's probably a bit out of my league, but a bit out of my latigue. <laughs> yes. So that, I can I mean, put and, and everybody, I can I can um, I can throw links into the comments on here. I know earlier my friend Robert was asking about you know at some of the records that you were that we were referencing, so I can always put them down there. Good, um, thank you. Yeah, someone someone spelled it right there, Jacques Henri Lartigue. 
Oh, there uh, we go. Any other Twitter listening parties on the horizon? Bluebell Knoll, Full Can the Cafe. Yeah, I think I'm, I mean, I, I, I may well do a, 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 a Bluebell Knoll one. Um, we have been talking about it. I was like reticent to do a second one because I didn't want people to think that, you know, it was all about me, me, me. But um, so many people have been asking. I think maybe that'll happen. Um, any other Bell Union artists? Yes, the, Tim Burgess himself has a solo record coming out. Um, in May, which is amazing, and um, he'll we'll be doing one for his record. Pompoko did one a couple of weeks ago. Lanterns on the Lake did one recently. Um, BC Camplight is doing one on the twenty seventh, and it hasn't been announced yet. But I'll tell you because you all seem very nice. Um, there's a Mid Lake one for the Trials of Anne Occupantha on the twenty sixth of April. I don't know the time, but. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't wait to listen to that again. I mean, uh, I mean, I've put the record out, and I mean, I must have listened to it a million times. But give me any excuse to listen to the Trials of Van Panther and I'll jump at it. It's well, and, it, and, it, and like you said, it's not just you listening on your own. It's you listening with a thousand and thousands of other people around the globe, and it does change how you hear it. It does. It's so powerful, and it's emotional. Like I. Abby, Abby came into the into my studio um, while I was doing the Heaven in Las Vegas one, and I, I'm I'm not sure whether she knew because she was sitting behind me, so she couldn't have seen my face. But I was, you know, I had tears pouring down my face for pretty much most of it because when you're sort of remembering things that are emotional, that were emotional anyway, and you're you're remembering them through through this kind of weird telescope back to the back to the 90s and then you add in thousands of people listening to it with you you you, you... and i'm just looking at these times when the internet drops out for simon as commercial breaks this gives you a little bit of a break to um shake it off shake it off for a second um because you know he will be right back on and um and it is it makes for little cliffhangers and he's coming back and he's coming back here he is we're just it's it's it, it all you always seem to drop off where there's a cliffhanger just like it would be know. you know it's, it's uh, like America's somebody got doesn't, doesn't want me to be too serious i just just keep this very light and as soon as i start getting too like uh emotional about something it's like no nope, gonna cut you there fella well yeah because some of the tracks on that record are re i mean they're really emotional tracks yeah they are and they they bring back a lot of memories because if you sort of look at the album as a, as a as a whole it's a very short record as a lot of as words it's only, it's only 36 minutes long um and you know starting at 10 p.m at night you know but by 36 minutes past 10 you're kind of done and it goes by it so quickly yet to re to recall all those emotions it's exactly it, it, it feels like it it's taken a lot longer than 36 minutes to sort of get back to 1990 or 1989 whenever it was we were making it um because the record is full of it, it it's full of the the birth the death um, and and all the stuff in between, and the jo the, the joy that, that that Elizabeth and 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 Robin were having at just having had their baby, and my father just passing away, right bang in the middle of it. Um, there, there, there's these two sort of wildly differing emotions going on, and I think that's probably one of the reasons the record is as good as it is because it has you know it's also a depth to it that um a lot of records don't have um you know but so going back there and sort of thinking about like i don't know a track like wolf in the breast or or, or um i wear your ring or Fru Fru foxes which which i'd sort of kind of started off um, with with keyboards and piano and stuff and and fruitful foxes I actually wrote like pretty much the day a day after my dad died and um, I don't know like I'm a very generally quite an unemotional person in some daily life um, but I do get quite upset about 
things more as I get older than I did when I was younger. And I, I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Um, maybe it's just about growing up. Maybe it's just about owning um, owning your emotions and just accepting who you are and accepting that, uh, you know, if you didn't grieve a parent's death at the time, th that's okay. You, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. And you might, people might think, well, why wasn't he upset or, you can't. So you don't have a clock for these <laughs> for these emotions. It sort of it doesn't just happen when it happens. It just happens when it happens. And and maybe I I grieved his death much 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 later. And maybe I'm still I still haven't got there. Maybe um, those I'm when it comes to something like your that. like like your dad. It's I don't think that um, there are certain types of grief that I don't think ever actually go away. I I I, I think that they go in waves, but especially especially your father was so influential on you with his music and his life it's it's well you know the thing is not to, not to contradict you because oh, that that's obviously true it, uh, on the face of it but um the reality is is i don't i don't think uh, he is now you know and i i i've made sure that um his legacy will always be remembered and that his music won't, won't be forgotten. I've, I've worked very hard to make that happen over the last few years with the release of the, of the records that we put out, uh, celebrating his work. But, um, I honestly think if I'm really, really truthful about it is that during my sort of teenage years, um, I think teenagers these days, there are a lot of them anyway, there are so families can, 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 can be a little, bit closer to each other and talk talk more and appreciate each other even though the age gap difference is quite considerable in my generation my parents generation kids parents didn't really talk didn't really talk to their children <laughs> you know is sort it of like there was a big distance between parents and their kids in the in the 60s and 70s you know you spoke spoke when you speak when you're spoken to all that kind of stuff you know and even though my parents were, were great um we weren't really close, you know, he was a lovely bloke and I absolutely adored him. Um, but it wasn't, he wasn't like around an awful lot. He was working. Uh, he was, he was working away a lot. Um, so I can't really say that I got his music or really appreciate what he was, what he'd been doing until, what is that noise? Is that your dog? That was my dog just left. Oh, it sounded like my dog, like chewing a bone or something. But um, yeah, so I don't really appreciate my dad till much, much, much later. And I sort of probably have suffered, struggled a bit with the, with the guilt part of that for, for a long time. So I think that's what sort of fueled this desire to put um, his music out there and for, for people to appreciate him you know, for what he did. And, and it helped me appreciate him because finding out all this stuff about him in my forties and fifties, I'm like, holy cow, you know, I didn't know he did this. I didn't know he did that. Cause he never talked about it. He ne my mum did, didn't even know half the stuff he did. I, rem I remember Abby will, will, will remember this story. There was a, a record that I found on Discogs um, that he made. It was a Hawaiian sort of uh, instrumental album with, that was done with singers and an orchestra and it was a very middle of the road kind of music you know uh you can just imagine came out in the sort of late 60s early 70s the sort of instrumental hawaiian classics and um he put it out under the name not ivor raymond but it was put out under the name ray miranda ray miranda orchestra and i found it and his name is on the back if you look at all the, the, the credits and everything, it, it's obvious that it's him, but uh, the name of the, the record is, you know, Hawaiian, whatever it is, uh, by the Ray Miranda Orchestra. And I went, I got it and I, on Discogs for like £1.50. And um, um, I called my mum up and said, did you know he did this, this record? It's so good. And she was like, no, he, that, that's not him. And I went, no, no, it really is. And she went, well, you thought... Are you saying I don't know the stuff your father did? I said, well, no, I'm sure you do, Mum. But she was like, no, that wasn't him. 
you're mistaken. <laughs> okay, mom, whatever. So I didn't bother arguing with her because you don't argue with your mother. But uh, that's that's really sums up the kind of discovery part of, of me and Ivor Raymond. It's like even now I'm still finding things out that are blowing my mind that he did. Um, the first record we put out was called Paradise which was some of the famous stuff and some of the kind of not so famous stuff. And then the second record Odyssey was mostly a lot of the kind of obscure, strange things that he did that um, we only just recently found out about uh, some of the Northern soul stuff. And so, yeah, I'm appreciating my father right now. And I, I really do wish I'd appreciate him more when I was alive, but you know, I was a 14 year old when punk happened and, you know, punk rock wasn't about like being respectful to your parents. <laughs> you know, you were doing your job, like you were doing your job as a teen son, right? I guess, but uh, you know, it's because he died so early. You know, I I didn't really ever have the chance to say, you know, man, you were really fucking great, and I think you're amazing. But maybe putting out those those two albums, you know. It's my way of, of saying it to him now. Exactly. And, 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 he, and, you know, Simon made this comment about grief coming when, when, you, when we're ready to receive it. And I think that's, that's, that's so true. And yeah. you, you just said it yourself. You need your father more now than, than ever. And, and he's here for you, you know, yeah. his music at least. A gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Would you say, would you say that he's influenced the lost horizons records? No, I wouldn't say so. No. Um, maybe I'm too close to, to, to them at the moment to, to have the perspective to know. Um, I tell you what, I, I, you know, I, I, I am sort of always in awe of him because of, of his talents. And uh, it, obviously we, we have, I, I, it's not like I'm playing myself down. I do know I'm decent at what I do and, and um, have, have, have some, <laughs> some skills of my own, but uh you know, he was really at the top of uh, 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 of the tree in, in terms of uh, of arrangements back back in the sixties when you know it was so competitive. You know, you, in the states you had like Burt Bacharach and, and Nelson Riddle and you know these these sort of legendary uh, arrangers. And then in the UK you had you had him and you had Wally Stott and um, Reg Guest and you you know a sort of a sort of Soho v v variation of what was going on in in New York and Los Angeles and. And to have been at the top of that uh, tree, you know, it, it it really impresses me amazingly. And I would never ever dream of comparing myself to him. And I've got friends in bands like like Jonathan from Mercury Rev, who's also a big fan of uh, my dad's stuff. Um, he's always like, you know, you should do arrangements, man. You you've got it in the genes. You know, you should. Uh, you'd be a brilliant arranger. You should. Um, uh, I, 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 I appreciate the sentiment, but I just, I won't, I'm not going to go there because I don't think it's important to kind of just do what your dad did. <laughs> you know, no, no. It's important I, I, to do your own thing and be true to that. And and you know, his skills were of a different era. You know, he he grew. He went to Trinity College of Music. He 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 uh, he wrote. He he was a scholar. But, you know. He, he was, um, uh, what do you say? How, you know, he was like at the top of his game. He could read read and write music. I, I can't do any of those things. I don't read music. I couldn't play someone else's song if you if you asked me to. You, you sit me at a piano and ask me to play someone else's tune, I would just shrivel up and die. But I can sit there and play any of mine and, and entertain myself for the rest of my life and come up with great tunes, but I can't play anyone else's because I I'm not interested in playing anyone else's. So that's the sort of thing, you know, so I want to be me. And I'm, I think that's my, that's my thing right now is, is not to sort of be drowned in this sort of son of Ivor Raymond thing. <laughs> no, I don't think I am. No, it I'm doesn't doing. seem like you are at all, but it does okay. seem like you're, you're giving it like the proper place. Do you know what I'm saying? Like putting out those records and, and, and going into sort of the mystery of who he was and how that, how that can impact you just as his son is interesting enough. You know what I mean? You don't need to, you know, be a junior, so to speak. I think so. Um, and sometimes, listen, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, 
in the second half of my life uh, or the last quarter or however you want to look for look for it so i'm i'm still learning i'm still working things out and um i'm still interested to hear other people's opinions about things i'm not so set in my ways that i'm not like larry david just yet <laughs> you know close hey <laughs> we we have a question are you ready for a question go for it Okay, so it's a question about um, individual credits on some of the Cocteau's pieces. Uh, no, I don't know what you mean by that. He's, yeah, he just says, I know you've gotten some individual credit on the writing of Fruit for Foxes and Kefskin Smack. Are there others with Cocteau Twins? Always been curious. Well, well yeah, I mean, uh, that's, I don't know where that comes from because the, the, the albums from Treasure through till milk and kisses were all co-written by the three of us um all the songs well obviously not victoria land because i was doing i wasn't on that record at all um and i was doing the this mortal call record but um yeah we we wrote all the songs 33 33 33 that's how it always was and that that's i don't know where these credits uh, are appearing because certainly on the records and on discogs or wherever you see things officially um you know, we were all credited uh, correctly as co-producers and co-writers. So, I mean, just in terms of the Twitter listening party and talking about Heaven or Las Vegas uh, in reference to those songs, um, I was not claiming credit for um, writing the songs. That wasn't the point of the story. The point of the story was really just to give some anecdotal um context to where the song came from you know and how it, it how it originated um and i'd like to think that throughout the conversation you know i would say me and robin would sit and jam with this one and he'd play guitar and i'd play the bass and we'd mess around and then we'd get the tune and then liz would come in at the end and sing and that that's how we wrote the most of our songs but every now and then like with Fru Fru foxes with calfskin smack you're correct um it would be done slightly differently and you know i'd write all the chords and, and that would be the song would be written sort of chord chordally um on on a keyboard on a piano it's very hard to write a song on a bass do you know what i mean it's like we would write our songs in the early days by jamming together and coming up with a tune between us you know um but when we weren't all around in the studio at the same time because of all the drama um the writing process did change a bit and it meant that you know he might be there robin might be there doing some things on his own for a while and i would arrive the next morning and be doing some things on my own for a while so the songs were sort of written in pieces if you know what i mean but um no uh, the songs are, are written by all three of us and uh, that's how it is and that's how it is hey yeah. is, is there anybody that you get starstruck by that you that like i mean your 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 studio was with pete towns and you know robert smith is like so influenced by your music there's there are so many sort of like music gods out there that adore you and your work that i'm curious if you ever kind of jaw drop around anybody if anybody does that to you anymore very not so many but um there's a couple. I mean, I'm still quite in awe of Nick Cave, even though he lives like in the same town and I've seen him and I've met him a million times and I'm still all struck by Nick Cave. I think because, so like I was into his first band, The Boys Next Door, and then um, in like the late seventies and then when he formed the birthday party, you know, I saw that band probably not, not more than, any other band ever, but um, I probably saw them 20 times and I was just so into them from day one. And I've kind of loved Nick Cave for 40 years. I know that's fucking crazy if you think <laughs> about it. I can't even believe I just said that. 40 years. The guy has never made a bad record. No, he hasn't made a bad record. Bowie made bad records. Lou Reed made bad records. Leonard Cohen made bad records. They're all gods, right? Nick Cave never made a bad record. So, yeah, I'm a bit in awe of that guy because um, 
he just continues to innovate and continues, even though he's sort of doing his thing, he's just so amazing at it and he's so truthful. He, he gets right to the center of it. And the last few records, they're hard to listen to. There's no, there's no getting around that because they're super emotional records about very personal things. But as pieces of music and art, they are um, untouchable. And and you could say, what is he now? He, he must be in his sixties. Like Bowie, you know, people are getting better in old age, not worse. Used to be the other way around, didn't it? But um, uh, so Nick Cave is one, and probably the only other one is um, Patty Smith. And I, I, you know, I she's on Bella Union, so I I can't really be too in awe of her because that would be weird. But I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I am because she's just like one of the greatest human beings that ever lived. That's just a fact. Yeah. She's, she's a great human. She's a great artist. She's a great writer. She, I, she, I don't know if you recall this story and we might've even talked about this. Like she was on a book tour. She was in Chicago and at the book tour, somebody came up to her and gave her back this box of stolen items that were stolen when she was touring in Chicago, like decades ago, decades ago. And, and so she's standing there and the audience started to get tense. Like, who is this person? How does this person have these items? Like, what did they do to, to, to Patty? And their, so their van had been broken into, they stole the equipment, but they also stole all the gear. One yeah. of the pieces was a, was, a, was, a, was a bandana that her brother had given her and her brother had since passed. So she's standing on this stage in front of us at this university and she grabs this bandana and like the poise and the grace that she had was just astounding so there is there is something about her that is um so the antithesis of being a rock star but so oh, being yeah. a rock star that, that, at the same time the that impresses me the most you know uh because the, the first time i sort of came across her like as a human well actually um i went to see her in 1978 at this place called the rainbow in north london um, she was, a, was, a, was a, she was supported by the reggae regulars. I remember that. And I remember Johnny Rotten being outside the venue. Um, and I was kind of into public image and had been into the pistols before that. So when I saw him, I was like, I was like, what was I 16? Um, and I actually went up to Johnny Rotten with a pound, I had a pound note and I, I asked him to sign it and he just went, fuck off. <laughs> and I kind of like, I don't know. I thought that was actually more impressive than signing the pound would have been. So, um, so that was the first time I saw Pat Smith. But then the next time was uh, Cocteau Twins were playing uh, Roskilde Festival in Denmark, uh, which is a really, really wonderful festival, one of the best in the world. And um, Pat Smith was on the bill. Cocteau Twins were going on after Pat Smith, which felt totally wrong to me. We should definitely have been supporting her, not the other way around. And Tom Verlaine, who is one of my all-time guitar heroes, he was playing guitar in her band. So I got to stand, sit on the stage, on the side of the stage and watch her and it was pretty much an education really because you know her control of the of the crowd and, and just her personality and her strength of, of as a human being as she said the way she connects with people uh abby and i went to see her on the 40th anniversary of, of horses at, at primavera and, and also in, in ireland with nick cave actually and we flew over to, to see that show and she is just an incredible human being. What I should say, should say about the, the Roskilde event, because I was sort of a bit in awe of her this year, whatever the year would have been, probably 1996, I guess. So um, what period would it have been? So sort of a, a year or two after Power to the People, do you remember that record? Yeah. Um, you know, not, not one of her greatest records ever, but still an important moment. Uh, and that song particularly was connecting with people for obvious reasons. Um, and Alanis Morissette was the headliner of the festival this year with Jagged Little Pill was like the, the biggest album of the year. This must have been 96, I suppose. Uh, I don't really know whether it was, but that's what I th my memory is telling me. And she was... No disrespect to Alanis. Well, I'll tell you the story. I mean, she was like swanning around backstage like she owned it, you know, and she had like the sort of 
six security guards on this side and six security guards on that side. And, you know, all the security guards were like, yeah, keep out of the way, you know, get back. And I was like, we're, we're in Denmark, you know, like no one gives a fuck. I don't know why are you sort of acting like, like you're, you know, you own the place. And there was Patty Smith, you know, barefoot in the back, just hanging out with punters, hanging out with bands. Was she dancing barefoot? Was she yeah, pretty much she was hanging out barefoot, you know, exactly. Yeah, dancing barefoot in the park. She was hanging out, um, just being this earth mother, you know, and, and everyone adored her. And I just thought, yeah, well, I know which two two ways I'd rather be here, you know, out of the choice of of who you'd want to, whose shoes you'd want to be in. I'd rather be in Patty Smith. So I, I've always loved her, and it's it feels very weird to be to be. Uh, releasing records with patty smith on belly union but there you go life you is go. Weird. she kind of in it this is going to sound kind of like a strange thing but there's something about ezra Furman that reminds me of patty smith and i i think it's um they're, they both kind of have that androgynous kind of vibe right they both are really raw they both just go like right to an emotion and it's not necessarily about um like uh, uh, normal or standards of beauty to like typical beauty standards. It's, it's they just, they're just raw and powerful and vulnerable all at the same time. And there's, there's something that's, there's similar quality there. Yeah. It's, and it's the way that their songs speak to people. Um, and the fact that, you know, someone like Ezra, you know, he, his, as you, as you can see from his audience, his live audience, particularly it's, he's speaking to to if we're all if we all feel like outsiders ezra is our spokesperson you know for that for that moment when we're there thinking oh man i, I just don't fit into life i don't fit into society I, I just feel like a bit of a freak you don't feel a freak when you're standing with ezra Furman singing at you. you you feel completely accepted and you feel completely um loved by him uh, because he knows who you are and I think that's what great art does. It, it has that ability to sort of cross the boundary, um, the, the normal boundaries that we sort of put up between like hero and, you know, oh, wow, you know, we should respect. The, 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 he breaks down that barrier and he just relates to people on a, on a, uh, on a, on a quite a profound level. I think people totally get that. That's why they're, they're adored. That's why Patty Smith and, and Ezra are adored. I think that's a really great point. Um, and I do agree with you. They're well, and it's funny. I just thought of this. They're both Midwesterners. You know, Patty's from Detroit, and Ezra's from Chicago, and yeah. um, and that was another one of our weird little connections because I was in that Ezra music video like back in 2012. That which 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 track do you remember? It was called um, "I'm Gonna Break Your Heart." Oh yes, and, and they and they, they shot it at uh, Double Door, which is another. It was a great club in Chicago that ended up closing just a, a little bit ago. But he was just he's just a dear. He's just like such a good human. Yes, yeah, somebody has commented here. Um, he is a, he is a darling Ezra. We love him to bits. Um, Jason Pierce is a legend. I was delighted that he signed with Belly Union. Well, me too, Jason. Good, uh, Nick, Nick, good lord. Um, it was a day that I could barely believe had happened. And I've been a huge fan of Spiritualized for, uh, you know, most of my adult life or since they've been going anyway. So I'm, I'm a very lucky boy. You know, I get to work with my with, with a lot of people that I admire deeply. So, and he, he's one of the loveliest people on, on the planet, Jason is. He probably gets a lot of bad press from, from behaviors that people maybe frown at. Or have frowned out in the past but he to me anyway uh i can only say an incredible humble gentle soul that he is he's so you know into his music and wants it to be absolutely perfect for for himself and for you so he, he he's a perfectionist um and he will take as long as he takes to make a record and that sometimes that's longer than we all will that we all want because we all want to hear new spiritualized music but i'll let you into a um, a secret that he is close to finishing his next album and uh it's almost there <laughs> you have to be careful when you say a spiritualized record is almost there because 
we signed him in 2000 and gosh, I can't even remember now, maybe 12. And, and didn't release the record till, I don't know, four or five years later, six years maybe. And I kept thinking the record was almost finished throughout every single month of that six years. So you have to be careful a little bit, but, but from, from what I understand, it's, it's, pretty nearly done he's as he's as close to finishing his as i am to mine but it, well now now you've got a little race you can have yeah, a little race can, i'll put i'll put my record back months if it means this is going to come first we want to compete with that hey, this question has come through in various forms and these questions are always so difficult you know like if people have asked okay what's your favorite the favorite song what's your top three songs what's your what what are, what are songs you're most proud of what would you what would you say if you had to say just right now at you know yeah, at whatever three time songs it is? all time today <laughs> um oh my god that's a ludicrous question it's uh, pretty ludicrous i, I know people uh, like uh, this pick three out of nowhere i mean there won't be like the greatest songs of all the time there'll just be ones that are like uh, are meaningful to me um maybe like see no evil television um maybe it's raining today by Scott Walker and um, Tell Me Easter's on a Friday by The Associates. Uh, there you go. Three you ask me again in five minutes, I'll come up with three completely different ones, but they'll 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 do for now. But I mean they're just it's just personal things, isn't it? You know, like the Associates, I go a massively important band in my life. Um, um, Scott Walker, I mean if we go, if we start on Scott Walker, we'll still be here at four o'clock in the morning. So that's I did tell you we had eight hours, you know. So <laughs> I'm obsessed with Scott Walker and uh, and and stuff, and you know his connection with my family, and uh, and uh, getting to curate the Scott Walker proms uh, for the BBC a couple of years ago before he died was probably one of the greatest days of my musical career for sure. So I've got to have a Scott Walker record in there somewhere. Uh, what other songs? What other questions have we got here? Oh well, the question. There was also a question about um, not other songs, but of your body of work. What are the ones that you're most proud of? Oh, uh, your favorite, your favorite children, favorite so to speak, or, or, or songs. Um. Well, I'm. I really love the places we've been, which is a Lost Horizon song mm -hmm. that um, Karen Paris from the Innocence Mission co-wrote with us i love that piece of music and i think it's it's special uh and i'll be very proud of that um cocktails it's funny i was i'll tell you something because me and abby were talking about it in the kitchen yesterday because I, I don't think she knew either i was gonna mention it during the in the during the listening party for the heaven and las vegas thing and i i, I mentioned the track briefly a track called watch la which is on the B-side of, 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 of Ice Blink Luck. Um, mm -hmm. And I mentioned it, but uh, all of a sudden everyone was like, oh, no, no, Mizake the Mizan, which is the other B-side on that on that record. But it's, it's like way better. So I kind of, I didn't want to contradict anybody, so I just kind of left it. But I was going to explain why I love Watchless so much and why it's sort of, it's um, special to me. And uh I was trying to explain it to Abby in the kitchen the other day because I walked in while Abby was making some one of her beautiful dinners and um, she was listening to Donna Summer. She had this Donna Summer track on called The State of Independence. Now, she's a massive Donna Summer fan, um, much, much more than I am, but she'd never heard State of Independence before. Um, and that track in a weird way was very inspiring uh, and in if you listen to watch La and you listen to state of independence by donna summer you you can maybe sort of see the thread between the two because we were listening to it a lot um subconsciously you know was that my dog or your dog no it was mine it's dinner time um, so um 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 i can't remember what i'm saying now so so yeah like I, it's very unusual for, for, for Cocteau Twin songs to have been described as coming from somewhere else because they usually just come out of nowhere. 
but that song in particular was one that did seem to have a, g a genuine sort of uh, influence from uh, from a Donna Summer song. It's so unlikely, isn't it? But um, it is unlikely. Um, but, but now uh, I'm going to have to listen to him back to back now. Yeah, I mean, well, the we, we did that. We did it in the kitchen. I said, put it on now because she, she. I think she probably never heard of Watch Lara either, because uh, it is a, you know, it's a little known song. But uh, if you listen to it back to back, you'll the, the bass the bass synth kind of thing is pretty similar. A bit of a rip off, really. Yeah. <laughs> she should have. She should probably have sued us. There's a what question. Cold Drops Yard. What do I think of Cold Drops Yard? What is a is it a band? It's a place, isn't it? I I, I think I've been there um, and do the label marketplace. Isn't that where we do the label market? Is that what you mean? Young. Yeah, we'll have to, Alexander. You're going to have to comment on that. I don't know what you mean. Back and, and, and explain what you mean about that. Um, and then, oh, this is a good one. What it, what's the what's the meaning of heaven or Las Vegas? Well, it's whatever you want it to mean, but I mean, I, I guess it's it's fairly obvious. It's two polar opposites, isn't it? My friend Jeff that I was talking to last night said he saw you on the Heaven or Las Vegas tour at Las in Las Vegas. Oh wow! Yes, we played at the we played at the Aladdin Casino on our final night of the American tour. What's a what's a mess that was? Good gracious! What was yeah. what was a what what was well, a mess about it? Was a very it? messy, very messy night because I think it was sort of at the height of the, the of the drug taking. And there were an awful lot of journalists had flown over from the UK, you know, like as to do front cover features for um, the weekly music magazines. And um, there was a lot of misbehaving going on. And I don't, I don't think we came out of it particularly well, if I, if I remember correctly. But it is an awful long time ago. It is. So I can be forgiven for not remembering, but um, I think we were the first band to play the Aladdin Casino since Elvis, which felt pretty cool. Um, and it was a terrible gig. I mean, you, who plays who plays in a casino? Well, obviously, Elton John does, doesn't he? So I guess that's not really a thing to say. But uh, it didn't seem the right place to play for us, you know, fake palm trees and all that. But um, it was funny. It was a funny it's, well, it, it it seems kind of um, it seems like an ironic choice or like just a an odd an odd. It just seems like you know the the the, prom, the booker said you know why don't why don't we finish the tour in Vegas? You know we probably went oh, for God, don't be ridiculous. And then we thought you know what I've never been to Vegas. <laughs> Let's go. Let's f spend all the tour money um, in the casino. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, if if. If your brain has to go even further in the past, Nick wants to know about your first appearance on Top of the Pops. We never appeared on Top of the Pops. Yeah, I was going to say there. I, I don't recall seeing it. There, there's when I look through the different um, the different videos, like I don't recall seeing Top of the Pops. Well, no, we we did get asked to go on. I seem, I seem to recall, but we we turned it down. Um, we got to number twenty nine in the charts with Pearly Dewdrops. And um, I think we got a call to go on, but we we were just terrified and just thought we'd look so stupid next to all these dancers with balloons, and it wasn't something we should be doing. <laughs> so we we turned it down. We did the old grey whistle test. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. Um, that was horrible. It was a horrible experience. I mean, yeah. now is that one of the ones where you have to lip sync and they're not you're not, not actually playing live? No, you're just faking the lip syncing one, but. Um, Oh, Grey Wizard Test was it was it was a great show, uh, and it was sad when it went off the air. It was a really brilliant show, and some of the greatest performances by um, you know were, were done on that TV show. I mean, there's actually a public image performance that I t posted on my Facebook page a couple of weeks ago of public image doing uh, careering and pop tones from the Metal Box album, and that 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 Old Grey Whistle Test performance is. It's absolutely legendary because it was the original right lineup with John Lydon, Joel Wobble, Keith Levine, and Martin Atkins on drums, and it was extraordinary. It was when they were really good, you know, before they went totally shit after that. Um, 
So All Grimmers Test was a great show and we were very pleased to be asked to go on it, but the actual experience of being on the show was, was a disaster. And um, we fell out with the BBC like so badly and that we didn't get asked to go back on on uh, on the on any BBC show for about ten years. What you do? What you do to piss off the BBC? Well, uh, nothing really. I mean, I I think w what we what we did was entirely justified, actually. And I I would argue if I was there today, I would have made exactly, I would have supported the decisions we made because. So here's the story. We we turned. It was it was presented by um this this guy. I was name. Uh, it will come to me. He was a young presenter. Someone on here will remember. Um, who was the Who was the presenter on the BBC? On the BBC Old Grey Whistle Test, he was a young, a young, a young, a younger guy. He sort of took over from 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 Bob Harris. Ah, come on, everybody, you'll remember. Not Bob Harris. It's the person that somebody, took over. somebody, so Google anyway, it. Google he, it. Out he there. Was the presenter. So he was there. And um, and then there was a producer who I'm not going to mention by name. Um, so we turned up at some godforsaken hour to do uh, no, not Bob Harris, the, the younger guy that took over from Bob Harris. So so we turned up to do our sound check uh, at like seven in the morning or something stupid, and it was taking taking a long time for them to set the stage up, and we were a bit bored. So Robin and I swapped instruments just. For nothing, for no reason at all, than just to have a bit of a laugh. So I strapped on this pink Jaguar, his pink Jaguar, and he strapped on my Fender Precision bass. And the guy said, "Okay, run through the song one one more time, please, because we want to get the camera angles right." So we just pressed play on the tape machine, and you know, we both knew the parts of, of each other. We both knew each other's parts because Andy Kershaw. Thank you. That was who it was. So. We both knew each other parts. We just played along with the tape. Liz sang her thing. I was playing the guitar. Robin was playing the bass. And then we get to the end of the of the of the run through, and the guy says, "Okay, that's it. We can break for breakfast, and the next band will be in um, afterwards." Thank you, guys. You can go now. So, we're, what do you mean? We haven't done it yet. We're not even playing the right instruments. And they went, "No, no, it sounded great. No, oh, it was beautiful." You don't need to do anything else. We've got everything we need. You guys are good. Thanks. So you thought it was you thought it was a run through. You you just thought we it was a rehearsal. Literally standing there, you, you can see it. You if you I mean, concentrating like looking at our guitars roughly, you knowing to, to make sure we weren't playing shit. But we were not playing our own instruments, and that was <laughs> that should not have been recorded. It should it was meant to be just to get the cameras in position. You know, you you do a TV show, they tell you just run through the song so we can get the cameras in the right place, and then we'll we'll get the lights pointing in the right place, and then we we'll take a five minute break, go and have a cigarette, and then come back and we'll do it. And that's how TV works. Not we're going to record you arsing around on stage, not even paying any attention. And then we're going to send you home. So we had a stand-up row with them, and I'm absolutely convinced that was the right thing to do. And they were like, "No, you're done." And we were like, "No, we're absolutely not done. We haven't done it yet." Um, and it got very, 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 very uh, tense, you know, to the point where not blows were, you know, no, no blows were exchanged. But um, there you have it. We didn't. We didn't ever get uh, get asked back on the BBC until the nine mid nineties on Mark Radcliffe and uh, and Mark Riley show. I mean, we were a bunch of twats. I mean, that you know, we were uh, like in general quite annoying people, um, probably from from a sort of perspective that they had because we we were in our own little bubble and we didn't compromise. And uh, we were probably quite annoying, I should imagine. I don't know. But, um, I'm just trying to read through the lines a little bit. <laughs> we, we, we didn't make I mean, what, that day. What, what else would they expect? You know, when that, when when you when you've got when you've got like an uh, an indie band on your show, like there's they're supposed to. Well, they like the same way, don't they? I, I think obviously we were just like the newbies in town, and we should just be thankful that we were on the show, and we should just bow and curtail and do whatever they told us to do because it's the great BBC. You know, that's kind of how we felt the whole thing was going down. And it's a bit like, well, if you don't want to see, you know, don't invite us then. But I mean, don't put us on the TV in a way that we're not even 
vaguely comfortable with. Um, this is not even the way we perform. We would never ever play the song live with him playing the bass and me playing the guitar ever. So why would you do? Why would you put that out on the television? It sounded fine. And in the great scheme of things, who gives a shit? Nobody cares. You're on TV. Be, be thankful for it. Yeah, I get it. But it felt wrong. Yeah. And, you know, you have to stand up and say, you, you know, are they going to make Prince do that? If Prince said, hold on a minute, I was I, I was playing the keyboard. I wasn't even playing my guitar. You think they're going to argue with Prince? No, they're going to let him do whatever the fuck he wants. But us, nah, you know, maybe they just thought Robin was an upstart from Glasgow and, and he needed to just get off his hind horse you know that's kind of how we felt they were behaving with us but there you go there that you go. The story it, of the old gray whistle test legendary performance <laughs> it is, it, well it is and somebody um jarlith put the link in there so we everybody can everybody can take a yeah, take a look laugh at me playing the guitar but that's that, that, that I, that's hilarious and it, it's these kind of things though that make you who you are as opposed to like, as as opposed to all the generic, you're so not you're so not generic, Simon. Oh, well, that's, that's something to be said, isn't it? Hey, I have okay. This is my this is my question. Do you have any like guilty pleasures, like just stupid, embarrassing songs that you like that you would not tell anybody except for the fact that it's so late at night and you're just hanging out and it's just the two of us? You could you could just tell me what your like, like dirty guilty pleasures are. Um, love 10 CC, love Earth, Wind and Fire. Um, I mean, I am older, so I'm, I'm entitled to kind of have a broader sen sense of music than um, I was when I was, you know, on the old gray whistle test. Because I can tell you, you know, from the ages 17 through to like, 22 I, I didn't like anything other than punk and nothing you know nothing well punk and reggae and that was it and i was just dismissed anybody over the age of 25 as even ha having anything relevant <laughs> to contribute to society i was very stupid um but now you know i don't have uh, uh i don't know whether it's a guilty pleasure but um I like things that maybe you know. I have a bit of Steely Dan every now and then. Um, but you don't know, tell any Steely Dan fans that, that don't don't tell a Steely Dan fan that you think it's a guilty pleasure, right? Well, that's the thing. What, what what's one person's guilty pleasure is another person's obsession, you know. Um, yeah, Chris Jackson says that no such thing as guilty pleasures. Yeah, I agree with that. I've probably got loads, but um, I don't look at them as guilty. I'm quite proud of them these days. Once upon a time, I might have been like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to tell anyone that I'm a, I'm a closet Steely Dan fan. And the fact is, I'm not a closet Steely Dan fan. I just like a lot of their tunes. We listened to this show um, uh, on a Saturday night on, on BBC Six Music. It's uh, Craig, Craig Charles's Soul and Funk Show. Um, and you know, once upon a time, I'd have been not listening to that. But we, there's, there's never a show we're not spending our whole time shazamming, going, "What is that? We have to buy that. We have to own that. What, that let's get that right now." We we do it about twenty times every program. I'm not even exaggerating. Probably half our half our beautiful record collection here is uh is from the Craig Charles solo function. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I don't want to just own a load of records that, that sound like my own band. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I've got very broad taste and I, I, I make the music that I make, but I'm, I'm just in love with amazing, amazing music. And it, does, it can be from any genre or any style. You know, I'm not precious. No, there's not, I, I, I would prefer, there are certain things that I don't, like for the most that you know there are certain bands that i don't like that are would probably like i don't like the grateful dead i've never liked the grateful dead i'm, I'm never going to be a grateful dead fan it's just not how things are meant to be but there are a couple of grateful dead songs that i like you know so yeah, I, don't I, know won't them. I don't know them i mean there's a whole huge gap in my um in 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 my um you know my listening uh that i couldn't really explain um we were talking about this the other day me and abs about um you know, because there was a period where she was sort of missing out on music because of 
schooling and, and stuff like that and traveling from one country to another f with her family and stuff for for whatever parental jobs and stuff and then there's me when i'm like in the band from sort of 83 through to 97 i'm not saying i never listened to music for those 14 years that would be stupid but i didn't listen to a lot of contemporary music during that period um and I'll tell you why it was, it was conscious because we did not want to subconsciously sound like anyone else. Cause if you're always, if you're in the music business and you're in a band and you spend your whole life listening to other new bands, whether you even intend it or not, you will go into the rehearsal room next week and write a song that's probably already been written by one of those bands you're listening to, or certainly be recreating the sounds. You, you most certainly won't intend to do it, but it's just the way music happens, the way we take it in and the way we take it out. It's like, uh, it's like breathing in and breathing out. You, you know, you just find yourself picking up these influences. You know, you go and uh, you, you're American and you come over and you live in the UK after a while, your accent changes and you start to sound a bit more British, same the other way around. Or if you're in Scotland and no, no, actually not in Scotland, Scotland, they never change their accent wherever, however long they live in another country. But you know what I mean? You assimilate and you, you take on some characteristics of, of the things you are uh, inhaling. Um, so we consciously avoided listening to uh, our contemporaries for fear of <laughs> surreptitiously taking on board some of their um, characteristics. Uh, and I think that was a wise move, even though I probably missed out on a lot of records. Um, and I, I definitely missed out on Grateful Dead. I don't think I've ever heard a Grateful Dead song. Um, well, I can tell you, you're, 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 not, you're not missing that much. And I think Trevor, yeah, yeah. I think Trevor agrees with me. I don't know Rush. I don't know Foreigner. I don't know America. I don't know Chicago. I don't know any of those kind of like big haired 70s rock bands. I know a little bit of ACDC, but not very much. You know, I just, just wasn't paying attention, I guess. Sorry about that. Well, you know, up. if you want, I, I, I'll, I'll make you, I'll make you a, oh, no, um, a big hair, a, a big hair compilation. <laughs> just so you don't have, you don't have to listen to the rest of it. You can just listen to the, like the key big hair hits. <laughs> what would have to happen for Cocteau Twins to ever come together for a new project? <laughs> Well, we'd have to go back in time. We'd have to go back in time and, and repair some of the things or just not do some of the things we did. That would be the only way that was going to happen, Rob, I'm afraid. Robbie. Robin told me once that Prisons wanted to produce you. <laughs> did you actually consider it? I could, couldn't see why. Well, <laughs> that's not 100% true. That's not 100% correct. He... He was a huge fan of ours, and you know that that's going to keep a smile on my face till the day I die. There's no doubt about that. Prince was this is an absolute genius. Um, to to think that he even played our records and and let alone liked them and and, and used them on his own records because he actually sampled sampled them as well. Um, we heard that he wanted to sign us to Paisley Park. Is the actual truth not <gasps> our, um, produce our records. I mean, you know, whilst we're all credited as co-producers, it's, it's no secret that, you know, Robin was very much the technical uh, wizard behind the sound of the band and the, and the reason the band sort of, uh, uh, the, records, the records sound the way they do. And there's, there's, there's no way he would have given that up, even for Prince. <laughs> I mean, we met Brian Eno because our record label wanted us to. Uh, what 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 record was it for? Maybe, mm, well, I think it was for Treasure actually. Wasn't it? Can't remember what year. My brain is not what it used to be. Maybe it was for for Blue Bell Knoll, but uh, the label wanted us to meet Brian Eno because he uh, he hadn't sort of he'd done the Talking Heads records and stuff, but he hadn't sort of done U two yet or Coldplay. So he he was like famous because he was in Roxy Music and, and and stuff, but he wasn't like kind of the big Charlie producer that he is today or, or in the 90s. But um, we met him and he was very lovely, you know. 
Well, it would be interesting to like take, you know how, you know, everybody does the remixes, right? If you could go back and sort of look, take one, take one hit, you know, or one track and then put it through like the Brian Eno filter, the Prince filter, the, you know, like different, different producers, the Terry, the Terry Jam, I mean, the Jimmy Jam and the Terry Lewis. You yeah, know? as a project, that would be fun. If you could do that now, uh, I'd, I'd like to It'd be to like covers now. almost. Huh? It'd be like covers. It'd be like production covers. Yeah, it'd be funny. But I mean, there was no way it was going to happen. And I mean, even, well, I don't know why yeah. we bothered meeting. I think we just did it just to, to, to keep I, Ivo happy because he, he thought it was such a great idea. And maybe it was a great idea if we weren't the people that we were and if Robin wasn't the, you know, the producer in his head that he was. Um, and uh, but, but we, we sat with Brian and Daniel Lanoir, as it, as it happens, who was his engineer at the time. Obviously, Daniel Lanois has gone on to be a great producer and musician in his own right. But when we when he when we met him, I mean, you'll probably remember. Well, he he did, him and him and him, Daniel and Brian made one of the most beautiful records of all time, uh, in my opinion, called uh, Hollows and Atmospheres, um, which I, I've loved ever since it came out. Um, both at thirty three RPM and forty five RPM, but that's a whole other story. And I was pretty excited to meet him from the perspective that the both of them had made, had made that record but it was a pointless meeting and you know at the end of the meeting brian was like well i don't think you really need a producer because you know exactly what you want your band to sound like and robin was like yep <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of that really but um it was very nice to meet him I still keep in touch with him now and I send him the odd mail here and there and, you know, we exchange pleasantries every now and then. Uh, it's nice to have Brian Eno in your address book. I'll say. Hey, Oscar wants to know if there are any unreleased Cocteau, Twi Cocteau Twins tracks. No. Well, I mean, there's, there's a few bits and pieces that we started um, after Milk and Kisses. Uh, you know, we, we started the idea of making a new record. Um, uh, I don't know what year it would have been, 96, 7, something like that, before we before Liz, you know, decided she couldn't really carry on anymore. Um, and we were, we had some, some good things going, I think, from what I can remember. We'd started a few things, and Liz had started. She, was really, she wanted to be much more involved in the uh, musical part this time. Because up until that point, Robin and I had done all the music, and she'd just come in at the end, you know, and, and done her singing thing, <laughs> you know, as if you know, as if just that. that wasn't significant enough. Um, but yeah, you know, she she wanted to be involved in the writing, and uh, I thought that was brilliant. But you know, it, it didn't. We never got very far with it. Uh, there were a few good things, from what I can remember. I think I've got a I've got a dat a dat a dat tape somewhere with the the kind of sketchings of, of songs on there but um never never close to anything really finished i don't remember um and as i said before you probably didn't hear because we've been on this thing for about 12 hours already but i said <laughs> earlier that um the band never had any spare tracks in the in the day we were making music before computers and before uh, the internet existed so in the old days and um, i can say the old days because it really was the old days now um we used to use two inch tape to record our all our songs so it's called multi-track tape and you basically you know could put up to 24 track well 23 tracks of music on, on this tape um and each reel only lasted like 15 16 minutes long 15 minutes long so and the each tape was really super expensive it was like a kind of hundred or something pounds per tape so you know every time you bought one it was quite a lot of money so you had to be quite sparing with your uh, your use of the tape it's not like now we could just carry on and just delete and keep making the music and have the 3000 tracks in each song. You know, we had to be very precise about what we did. So we didn't have anything left over. And as I say, we just recorded 10 songs. We may well have started something. And then after 10 minutes, 
flat, that's rubbish. But we just erase it and just record over it. We wouldn't keep it because there's not enough tape to just keep your duff bits. You've got to record over it because otherwise it's a waste of tape. Got it? Do you know what, do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. no spare songs, I'm afraid. Hard luck. Hard luck. Hard luck. That's but it is interesting how you know there were forced decisions and and the forced decisions kind of were a good thing it was a good thing that people had to decide right that's it uh, that, that's it and the band if you if you sort of step back which i can do now a bit easier than than at the time you know you can see that some of the records are a bit hit and miss but because of the very nature of the way that we worked and the, the style of songwriting it being pretty much an improvisation um and, and and you know i would be playing something and robin would be playing something and we'd make this tune together and it would all be recorded very quickly and then we'd build it and then in a couple of days time it would sort of be finished as an instrumental piece um sometimes you're going to get you're going to get it a little bit wrong and a bit it's going to be a bit hit and miss because it's all improvised for the most part so um i look back at some of the records and maybe cringe at a track here and there but uh you know, I, I think for the most part we did decently. We did decently. Oh, what is this one? Um, somebody's asking, Is tell us the name of that gorgeous instrumental you played live in 1986. Yes, it was a really cool track, wasn't it? Oh, did we have a name for it? I just think it was instrumental. I think it was just called instrumental. Because you have to remember that uh, Elizabeth was the the holder of the pen in the band. And she wrote all the lyrics and she wrote all the titles and she came up with all the album titles. And these things would happen very, 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 very late in the day, almost to the point of like tomorrow the record is being pressed. So you have to give us the titles. And if you don't, we're going to kill you. <laughs> um, that's kind of often how it got. Uh, but yeah, we did, you know, there wouldn't have been a title really, other than maybe a stupid title. We had stupid titles for songs. Um, as I said in the, uh, in the thing on, on the listening party, Road, River and Rail, we used to, we used to call Rod, River and Reel, the fishing song we used to call it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it was just stupid stuff. We had a song where we thought one of the, one of the, one of the guitar parts sounded like um, Fernando by ABBA. So we used to call that one Fernando until it had a real title. Or the ABBA one, you know. So uh, hey, here's a, here's the dog. Oh yay! Hey, it's buddy. a it's a good thing Liz wasn't like the BBC and then just said sorry. That song is going to be Fernando. You're stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey birds, you want to say hello to everybody? Here he is. Oh yeah. Here's my... Our dogs. <laughs> oh good licks, good licks. The whole world, I, I know, oh my gosh. Baby, go out and do your boots, go on. Go out in the garden, good boy. Bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> it is bedtime. Yeah, it's definitely bedtime for you. I, I mean, this you're, you're a late night kind of, you're a light, late night kind of guy, but you can well, just. Yeah, I am, an, I am, I'm not. Sometimes like 10.30, I'm like, oh, I've had enough of this, I need to go to bed. But um, as I was saying earlier, you know, we've our hours are just so weird right now because the anxiety levels are quite high. And there's that thing where, you know, you, you get into bed and you kind of put your phone on to charge and then you sort of think, well, I'll just have a quick look at Twitter and you know, it's just the worst thing you could do because then half an hour later you're like, oh, my God, did you hear what Trump said today? And then that keeps you awake for another half an hour when you, you've literally just got your mouth wide open thinking, oh, my God. Anyway, we said we wouldn't go there. So we let's go, go back there. to the questions. Any new signings coming up for Bell Union? Well, I mean, other than the ones you already know about, uh, there's this amazing new band I'm obsessed with called Drab City. Um, they are based out in, 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 in Berlin. I'm obsessed with them. They're amazing, and they're going to be huge one day. Um, I love them. And then there's uh, Mr. Ben and the Bens. Um, and everyone everyone always says to me, what, why, did you, why did you sign a band called Mr. Ben and the Bens? It's like the worst name in the world. And I I don't know about that. I think it's a fucking great name. 
because it's just so silly, isn't it? Mr. Ben and the Bens. But I mean, his name is Ben. His name's Benjamin. Um, so why not? It seems to make total sense to me. I love them anyway. They're gorgeous, gorgeous band. Um, and new things, new things. There are a few new things on the horizon, but I'm a bit nervous about signing anything new today just because of this world we live in. I don't know whether I can m make the same risks today that I could make a month ago. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. It's changed. It's changed everything. Um, and I'm not just being over. I'm not overreacting. You know, this is just a very scary time, and it would be stupid. It, it's bad enough. You know, you never really know how much to to give a band when you sign them. You know, whether you give them five grand or whether you give them twenty grand, it's a very hard hard number to get correct. Because if you sign five bands for twenty grand that's a hundred grand you just gave away and if um you know if if none of those bands are successful you know which is quite possible you know you just lost a hundred grand i mean who's doing that who's just frittering away a hundred grand these days nobody and i i'm not so uh, you have to be really careful about what you spend and what you invest in um and today is a very different day to to even march I would be worried about signing a band for one grand <laughs> right now. Because, you know, the signing of the band for a number is, is not... I've just got to let the dog out, sorry. Um, it's not the only number you're going to spend. You know what I mean? It's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. You're spending a lot more the minute you work with them. You've got to market them. You've got to spend money on the press. You've got to give them money to go on tour. You've got to make some videos. You know, uh, he's just constantly investing in the band. So what might be a grand as an advance or five grand, 20 grand or whatever it is, it's probably going to be 50, 60, 70 by the time the, re the record comes out. And then if the record, nobody likes it, you're kind of fucked. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I, I, I don't feel bad about it, though, because I think it's good to just take stock and just... It's not like we need any more bands, for God's sake. Look at no, look you've at got flipping crazy as it is. It is. It is. It it is crazy. And I have to tell you, like, not to just keep talking about Ezra, but the fact that his music, his music completely shifted sex education. It's like yeah. there are because so much of his music was in that show. It's like it's in it. You 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 can't separate the show from the music. It was so brilliant. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you feel the same way. You know, we're releasing the soundtrack in a, in a couple of weeks, so both both seasons of of his music will be on this album. So that'll be available very very shortly to anyone that wants to dig in. Because as you say, you you know his songwriting uh, that exists already on on some of the albums that he's released is good enough, but. Uh, you know the stuff he he wrote specifically for the show um, is amazing. So it's great to be able to actually have that stuff now available for people to hear. Because there were a lot a lot of people, rips being made, you know, of, of songs straight from the TV. People people that heard it like at the time that that couldn't find it anywhere. Because obviously, you know, it's very hard to coordinate a record release with a TV company because. They, they 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 don't even tell the people who who are, are in the show like when it's coming out and it's like oh it's coming out next week they, they just literally tell everyone it's coming out next week you, you can't make a record in a week you know it takes about five months to, to put up to put a vinyl together i mean you can put a record out digitally in, in a few days but you can't put out a record in a week you can't put out a record in a month not anymore it takes as you well know um, probably in America, you get it up, done a bit quicker than I can, but it's generally five months before I can confirm, could guarantee the record is going to be in the shops, you know, and that's a long, 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 long time away. So that's why those two records took a little bit of time to get together. But um, at least yeah. we're not putting it out two years after the show. At least it's only going to be a, a month or so. Well, and people don't, sometimes it takes people a while, while to catch the show anyhow. Yeah. So it, you know, people might just be finding out about sex education because yeah. of Ezra. So exactly. It, and vice versa. There's a, um, I don't know if you want to take, I don't know if you're up for any more questions. Yeah. But I have 
You are? Okay, because I have one about late 70s, early 80s UK indie label culture. So that's that's my that's my area of expertise right there. Where, where is that? I don't see that. Oh yes, it's, can you show um, you look at that? Oh man, that's how about your four D colleagues, Bauhaus, Matt Johnson. Oh, Matt Johnson, what a legend. I love the verse so much. Uh, Wolfgang Press, yeah, all, all top, so top people. Pixies, really nice things to remember. Uh, hello, Roman Artemenko. Nice to, nice to meet you. And thank you for my um, for my baseline from Angle Maker. You like it, man. Thank you. Uh, so share memories about late things. Well, I'll tell you why it's interesting, Roman, is, um, you know, as a, as a sort of 16, 17-year-old living in London and being able to go and see, you know, Wire, The Buzzcocks, The Slits, Penetration, Susan the Banshees, New Order, Joy Division, whatever I wanted to go and see every single night of my life. I'm so spoiled. I was so spoiled. I lived through what I considered to be you know, the best period in, in, in music. And, and 1979 is my favorite year uh, of, 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 of my whole life as far as music goes, because that I was 17. And that age, you know, is, is very important for all of us when we're sort of growing out of teen, we're sort of becoming, you know, a man or a woman, we're becoming, going from a girl or a boy into, into, into sort of adulthood. And we are sort of expressing ourselves and learning about, music and art and culture and i'm in london and all this post-punk stuff is happening and all these incredible labels are, are um are, are, are popping up literally all over the place you know postcard records in in scotland and you know factory obviously hugely famous rough train and like kitchenware in newcastle and you know i'm obsessed with it so i'm like in the record shops literally all day every day um and then I end up working in the record shop because I'm in there so much. I think they just got so bored of me going in and asking them so many questions. They were like, "Just, just, just come, just come behind the counter. You're going to be much more used behind the counter than you are asking me all these questions all day long." So I ended up working in Beggar's Banquet record shop, um, and it was that job. That is the reason I'm sitting here talking to you guys right now. That that job is is why I'm here because. Inside Beggar's Banquet Record Shop were the offices of 4AD and Situation 2. And Situation 2 was another subsidiary label of Beggar's Banquet, um, which the associates were signed to. Gene Loves Jezebel was signed to. The Charlatans ultimately were signed to. Um, what else? The Cult. Well, originally, I think they were the Southern Death Cult, weren't they? They were signed to them. So this whole indie scene, this whole indie label scene was was like, it was my life right you know i was um in there deeply uh obsessed with it and i got signed my first band or my first proper band called the drowning craze which somebody mentioned earlier um we were signed to situation two we were the, i think the second release on that label i think second or third um and that led to me being you know meeting robin and elizabeth you know, because they were signed to 4AD, we're all in the same building. You know, I met I met them in the shop. Um, so so the significance of that period is never ever lost on me, because it is who I am and it's why I'm here right now. Uh, because every relationship that I had when I was 17, 18 has had an impact on on um, on me talking to you right now. I wouldn't be here. Wouldn't be here if I hadn't walked into that record shop and made friend with the guy behind the counter. I wouldn't be here well well maybe i would be but, but highly unlikely because you know life is very very strange is it not you know how you go into this shop and you meet this person or you you go into this cafe and you have a coffee and, and then five minutes later you're going off there and you meet someone that becomes your best friend or you go on holiday and you know you, you sit next to someone on the train and i don't know we take the paths we take and and all of a sudden our lives goes in a certain direction and mine, I can 100% categorically say that walking into that record shop and being the inquisitive, passionate music lover that I was um, is why we are here conversing at close to one o'clock in the morning. 
Uh, but the, the the record shop thing, I love record stores where you have that. You were probably the record store guy where people would go in and they could talk to you and you they could say, okay, this is something that I really love. Tell me something new. And that you would be genuinely, lovingly take them over and help them find new music as opposed to like the high fidelity you know, that in high fidelity where everybody, all, all the all the people in, in the record oh, shop true. are a little too cool for school, and nobody's taste. Think about it. That's what, exactly what I'm still doing now. I, I'm still doing yeah. exactly the same job. I'm still the same guy. Because I mean, apart from that, me and Abby do run, have a record shop here in Brighton. But you know, I'm still doing the same job. I'm still inviting you in, pl saying to you, "I've got this thing. I really want you to hear it." I'm still doing exactly the same job. Nothing's changed. You're still 17. <laughs> well, you know, I, I feel like it. Feel like it in my head. I mean, physically, more like 117. But you know, certainly in my head, I still feel very youthful and uh, full of ideas and and uh, good spirit and stuff. But um, not as stupid and naive as I was when I was 17. Thank God. But yeah, it's, it's very interesting to to think of the uh, of the shop. Um, and I tell you what, I mean, I, I probably wasn't that guy in the shop at that point because I was probably a bit too, a bit shy, uh, shyer than I became. But the shop closed down literally in the around about um, like eighty two, something like that. And I went and got a job in another in another store, another record shop, like a, a bigger chain of record shops called Our Price, um, which is. A sort of a kind of like the Virgin Megastool kind of shops, you know, or Tower, like you had Tower and stuff in the States. It was a, it was a chain and there was, there was an hour price in, in every high street, you know, in, in every town. And I worked in the, um, the Kings Road branch in Chelsea and I worked in the um, Tottenham Court Road branch in, uh, in, in, in center of London. And I worked um, in Shepherd's Bush and I worked in lots of different stores and, it was actually that job that gave me a much broader uh, understanding of music because I was literally just into punk rock and nothing else and, and post-punk and, uh, you, you know, the stuff that, that I was likely to listen to and going to see bands every night. And the owner, the manager of the shop that I, that I was in, in which, which branch was it? It was Tottenham Court Road. It was a massive big shop. And for some reason, he really liked me. From, from 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 going straight in the shop, I got on really well with the manager. And so he used to shut the shop and instead of going home uh, or going to the pub with everyone else, he would stay behind and he would say, stay behind with me. And we, we smoke a giant and he'd play me some, because he, he knew that I, I only liked my thing, you know, mm -hmm. just my very, very narrow spectrum of music. And he was like, have you ever heard Pat Metheny? And I'm like, no, never heard of him. So he would play me Pat Metheny, and then he would play me Miles Davis. Have you heard of Charlie Parker? No, never heard of him. So he'd play me Charlie Parker, and then he'd, he'd play me Mingus and Thelonious Monk, and he'd play me all this crazy stuff, Sun Ra, right? You know, and suddenly I went from having this sort of much knowledge of music to, to, have it, to having a bit more, and um, being therefore more open to other styles and other genres, and then realizing that, I wanted to be the person that when someone came in the shop and said, listen, I'm really into kind of Pat Metheny, but I, I, I've got all these records. What else can I have? I didn't just want to go, oh, I don't know, just ask him. I w wanted to know. So his, you know, uh, championing of me or mentoring of me or whatever whatever you want to say it was, um, really, I really loved that. And, it, and it, it was, it sort of made me a good shop person and I became, I became a manager. Uh, of of that shop um and then i moved to another shop uh, as a manager as well and then i got, I got then i got demoted uh, to assistant manager because i managed to lose 300 um phil collins albums <laughs> phil collins, phil collins was the number one album in the chart at the time i think it was was it no honesty or something i can't remember the title of the record but it would have been like 1980 two three something like, like that no jacket required was it no maybe jacket? maybe it was the number did one did you album. lose them did you really lose them or did you dump them in the in the no, band no no I, I genuinely had no idea where they were but and it was <laughs> because it was the number one album in the shop you know it was a sort of like gaping hole because you know they used to have the, the charts 
racks on the wall when you walked in and like there was number two three four all full up but there was nothing in the number one and it was there was nothing in there for about a week and people were coming in going can i have the new f oh sorry mate, we're out i don't know where we're at. It'll hopefully be in soon come back tomorrow maybe it'll be here then and it, they'd come back in and it wouldn't be there and we're like one of the chart shops you know this is like a a sort of twenty thousand pound a day kind of shop. It's it's a massive big shop in the centre of London, and so then the area manager came round on the Friday to kind of do his rounds, you know, and make sure the shop was working all right. Now, in the basement of our shop, we 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 had um we would be preparing some of the other shops that would be opening up in Soho. So 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 because there was a very fast turnaround business, and there would be new shops cropping up all all around Soho, they would put them in our basement. And sort of get all the stock ready f to move to the next shop when it opened up. So he walks down the stairs and he says, "What? What? There's all these boxes. What are they all for?" And I was like, "I, I don't know. I just figure they're probably something to do with the with the new shop." He said, "Well, let's have a look, shall we?" So he opens it up and he goes, "Well, no, these are yours. These, this is Phil, the Phil Collins record. How long have you not had it in stock? I don't know, a couple of weeks. Go. It's the number one album." We, we would have, we should have sold like five things in the store by then. What are you doing? I'm like, I don't know, mate. I'm sorry, I didn't know they were there. No one told me they were there. He said, "Well, you really should have known." <laughs> so um, he said, "That's not good. That's that's really not good. That's that's just." <laughs> So he demoted me, and I, I was quite upset about it because I didn't think that was fair. I mean, in hindsight, it was totally fair. Um, hindsight of 40 years, maybe. But at the time, I was like, what do you mean? I didn't know they were there. You can't sack me for that. He said, no, I'm not sacking you, but I'm demoting you as of tomorrow. Now, I got home. Bill Collins almost ruined your career. Do you, yes, Bill Collins way, could have cost you your way, career. He actually made my career because what happened was I went home, and I was thinking of, uh, of what to do and whether I should just be like, go back in the next morning. And, you know what? You can just stick a fucking job. But <laughs> I didn't because I got a phone call in the morning from Robin, who I'd obviously become friends with Robin and Liz over the la last year. And uh, he calls me up and he goes, oh, hello, Simon. And I was just wondering if you'd like to come to Scotland and, and you know, join the band, you know, because we really like working with you. And, uh, and, you know, maybe that'd be nice. And I'd be like, sorry, you you want me to join the band? Like as a full-time member? Yeah, and come up to Scotland and we're going to do some recording and you come and be with us, yeah. So I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And then I went into work the next day and said, it really doesn't matter what you do because I'm not staying. I'm going right now. Thank you ever so much. I had a great time here. And that was that was that. And that was that. And that was that. That's hilarious though. That is such a funny story. Did you ever make mixtapes for people that came into the store? Um probably, yeah. Mixtapes were were probably were sort of maybe maybe more you're generate. I know that sounds patronizing. I don't mean it to. Maybe no, more, you're, more you're, it's, it's not. A, it, I well, I, and I ask because when I was in London, this is when I was in college. So it was ninety one. I was in London. I went to this record store. I was in love with the song that was playing, and I said, "I really want to buy this. I really want to buy this." And he said, "Well, I, it's actually not for sale." He said, "But I'm gonna." Uh, he, he said, "Come back tomorrow, and I'll make you. I'll, I'll make you a couple mixtapes." And so I came back the next day, and he gave me he gave me mixtapes of not only the record that was playing, but also other songs that were similar. So I had these great mixtapes oh, from this. It's the best way, the best way of exchanging music in that period. No doubt. I don't think I was really doing it. Um, it, was, it was also sort of like a kind of, you know, a, a way to sort of, you know, dating thing as well, wasn't it? You know, if you wanted to sort of exchange music and chat up a girl or chat up a boy, you know, you're just like, hey, shall I, I'll make you a mix, make you a mixtape. Oh, I put um, plenty of Cocteau Twins on mixtapes for boys. All, like, yeah. yeah. I think that's how a lot of the, a lot of our fans in America sort of, got into our band was through mixtapes and stuff like that because they were they were how people exchange music because i mean nowadays you just send someone a link those days you, you know 
you'd make a cassette. Um, but I mean, I was like, gr grew up with John Peel, you know, John Peel was like this amazing DJ on BBC radio and he was like my hero for forever. And I would like go to bed, um, with his, with a radio under my pillow, you know, listening to, to his show every night. And I would tape the show every night. I've still got all the cassettes of all the John Peel shows of all the sessions. Still got them in a huge box somewhere. Um, so tapes were hugely important, but I, I, I don't really remember sharing. Maybe I did actually. No, 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 no. I'm never thinking about it. I do remember making takes of people. Maybe more for sort of, you know, musician friends or. No, oh, I'll have to go back and look in my huge box of cassettes and see how many mixtapes I made because that's you've got my you've fired my imagination now. You've Maybe got it. Yeah, you you you've got you've got to check. I mean, it was an art. You know, because yeah. you only had a certain amount of time, so you had to be very decisive about what songs and create like the playlist, like all the things that you talk about as an as as a fan. We would do the same thing with the music. You know, what song is going to sound great after this? You know, and I would, you know, you'd love. To, it would always be fun to like mess with somebody and have like this really beautiful beautiful lyrical song and then go into like Nirvana or go into punk or the clash or, you know, just to like scratch the needle across. But um, yeah, I bet you, I bet you made some great mixtapes. And if, and if you haven't, I, I, I think that you need to make a lovely mixtape for Abby. <laughs> she, she makes them for me. Um, oh. Yeah. Cause I'm, you know, my, 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 my music listening habits are strange because I'm, I'm, obviously listen to music all, all day long, you know, from bands that are sending me stuff or bands that we've signed that are sending me stuff that they've finished. And I don't really have an awful lot of time just to sort of listen to music casually. Like, I mean, we, we've got this amazing collection of records here and another another whole wall of records in the other room. We're obsessed with vinyl and we, we play it all the time when we can, but um, because I'm sort of living music 24 hours a day as it is, just in my job and because I love it and it's my hobby as well as my job. You know, I, I don't always want to sort of get home from work to come in for dinner and listen to some more music, you know, I yeah. need a bit of a break from it sometimes. Um, and uh, I, I'm quite, as I said, I'm not very good at listening to things with other people. I, I like this. To, I like this to music on my own. Yeah. You know, headset cooking you know i mean the craig charles show on or whatever on saturday while you're cooking or something is, is beautiful and it's it's a it's a shared experience for us together and when we put record on in the house it's a shared experience but generally quite like listening to music on my own because i can really concentrate on it and um and see how it affects me because if there's other other noises or people talking and having a conversation with you at the same time i can't i can't tell whether i like it or not i can't concentrate on it i really need to concentrate on the music and I think that's, yeah. There's um, there's a book recommendation. I bet you Abby's read this book. There's a book, um, there's a writer for, and one of the editors at Rolling Stone named Rob Sheffield. And he wrote this book called Love is a Mixtape. And it's such a gorgeous book. I'm not sure. All, I think actually, we have that book. Yeah, I think we have it. All of Rob Sheffield's books are great, but Love yeah, is a Mixtape right. is beautiful. Yeah, I, I think we have that book somewhere. I'll, I'm I'm not I'm not a great reader either, so um, I've still got about 400 books to get through that um, I've received as gifts over the years. I, I'm I'm a good starter of a book, but I'm not very good at finishing them. Oh, that's right. You know, I think I sent you a book. I sent you Rob Sheffield's book about Bowie because he wrote a book about Bowie, kind of processing Bowie's death. Ah. Uh. And it came out right away, and I think I, I'm pretty sure I, I, I sent you that book. So look and oh. look through your collection, and look for the white book that says Bowie, and oh, yeah, put that on your list. That. Too. Yeah, right. yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say thanks before. I'm saying it now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see yeah. if there's okay. And just so you know, everybody has that that has asked about Cocteau Twins getting back together there you're we've been talking for a while because we're just kind of hanging out here but it's not getting very unlikely so I'll just all those questions are now answered um yeah thankfully that I can't see any of them so uh yes it's very very unlikely the Cocteau Twins will reform um 
It's a shame. I mean, listen, were things different? And were we all in the same country? Were we all of a similar of a similar mindset and in a similar place? And if we cared about things like money and stuff as a motivation for doing things, maybe it would be easy to, to reform. But I can only speak for myself. Money is the last thing I think about when making decisions about music, about something that I love. And the idea of going on to for a big fat paycheck just doesn't seem appealing to me. I'd feel like a total fraud. You know, uh, no one's, you know, yeah, I think I'll be, a, be flippant and say that I wouldn't like a million pounds in my bank account. I mean, everyone would. It's a, it's a life changing amount of money or whatever the sum is. Um, but I, I just can't entertain the thought of, 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 of going through all the stuff that one would have to go through. And the thing is, like, I can't explain to you all why the band broke up. In, in a in, in an online f- 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 Facebook chat, it, I, I I can't. I won't be able to do it in a book. I wouldn't ever. I wouldn't be able to explain it to you in a year, because I haven't even fucking worked it out. And I'm I've been trying to deal with it since I was thirty five. Well, thirty five. Whenever it happened, uh, I don't know. It's too complex. You just have to accept that some things are not going to happen much as you want them to. And I want talking heads to reform (laughs) because that is my favorite band of all time. And I want to see the songs played live and I cannot fucking believe I never saw them at the time. Why didn't I? I saw every other band. Why didn't I see talking heads? Maybe they didn't play very much in the UK or maybe it just was asleep i don't know why i didn't but it's a massive regret so i understand the need the desire to see them but you know there's plenty of other fish in the sea aren't there plenty and you can watch liz on youtube and dream (laughs) we all do yeah it is a dreamy thing and and you can yeah go Going back into the archives, it's so funny because when I think about sometimes seeing artists that I haven't seen, and like I I recently saw Adamant, it was fine, but it was yeah. no like it, it wasn't like seeing Adamant when Adamant was Adamant. You know what I mean? Like there's a different there's a different thing. Like if you want to go back and see like the specific tour of that specific record because that was the energy of the the that was the energy of the performance and it was all in with the time. So it's more, I feel like it's more about specific tours than it is about actually seeing the artist. I mean, I still want to see the artist, but there is something magical about when they're touring on an album. Yeah. And there is absolutely no doubt that fans of the band would be disappointed if we did. I I just know it. So that is also a big, a big no-no as far as I'm concerned. Why do something that's not going to be great? You know, we're, we're different people. We're different people. And let's talk about something else. It's, um, well, no, no, I know. But the other thing that's it's never going to happen. <laughs> no, no. But the other thing, and this is something you said way early on, and it's so true, is that you are not, you, you're not focused on the past. You're focused on what, what new things are you making? What new things are evolving? And so there's no point in doing a retrospective of anything anyhow, because you're working on new music. You've got new things lined up. You know what I mean? Yes. Let's, an- let's answer this question, uh, uh, Melissa. There's somebody has said, who influenced your distinctive bass style? It wasn't Joe Wobble or Stanley Clark, nor was it Mark King. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> this one. Oh, this King. is from Roman again. Gina Weymouth or Jack Bruce? No, I, I, I don't think I even knew who Jack Bruce was until I was much older. Tina Weymouth, well, no, I couldn't play like her if I tried. I mean, I adore her, and she's one of my favourite bass bass players of all time. We've just been talking about that at home. Um, but no, not influenced by her. I don't know, because 
it's funny like you know bass was it's like what happened with me and bass is i was i, I was trained uh, classically as a violinist when i was a kid and uh, i hated playing classical music and i was i was very good at it but i didn't enjoy it at all and i felt guilty about not in not being you know about giving it up when i did and i know my parents were distraught because i was kind of very good and a leader of the orchestra at school and all that all that kind of stuff set up for you know being a very good classical violinist but i absolutely loathed it hated practicing hated doing my scales and then i was 14 and the pistols happened and i was like hello <laughs> i i am not going to be playing the violin anymore and my brother gave me a bass uh, he got one from um, his friend Pat Collier, who was in the who was in the Vibrators, who were a punk band at the time. And he got the loan of this bass, or he bought it off him or something, and he gave it to me because he couldn't play it. And I went and bought Nevermind. I remember it as if it was yesterday. I went and bought Nevermind the Bollocks by the Sex Pistols, and I had this crappy little record player in my bedroom. And um, I plugged in, I plugged the bass into I don't know my my hi-fi or my cassette player or whatever, and I played along to never mind the bollocks and it was super easy for me and i was like i could hear the bass lines in my head and i could work them out very very quickly and within you know an hour or two i could play the whole of that album and i thought okay i'll be a bass player then and then that was it was sort of as, as as quick and as simple a decision as that so i went from kind of doing that to kind of um having my own band um, so I, I, I didn't really sort of listen to bassists in that kind of musoy way that that you might you might think. I mean, I respected uh, Michael Dempsey, who, who played with the original Cure uh, band, and then went on to join the Associates. I mean, but again, I, I just not technically good enough to even get near these people. So I I would sort of admire someone like Peter Hook or um, or Will Heggie from the Coxtons, one you know amazingly technical bass player. But I mean, I was like, well, I can't play like that. I can only really play like me. So I think my style sort of just came through my own inability to be as good as them. <laughs> it's just my limitations led led me to having my own style. Um, and initially it was a lot of strumming, open strings, chords, melodies, sort of, because the guitar, if you listen to a lot of the guitar parts, it's quite sort of not droney. That that sounds like it's a bad thing, but it, you know, it's a lot of two or three note kind of repetitive arpeggios, just over and over and over and over. Something like Persephone or Lorelei or, or tracks like that, very very simple. And then the bass line is the thing that's actually moving the tune around. And because I was, and maybe this is why they invited me to join the band in the first place. I don't know. I never asked them. But I'm assuming it's because I was quite a melodic sort of person, and that may be through my dad. That may I don't know, but um, so my style was quite you know all over the place, playing a lot of melodies on on the on almost like guitar lines, but on the bass. Uh, and then that sort of developed. And I was grew up loving dub music when I was when I was into punk. I was also into reggae, um, and I was a big fan of sort of you know. King Tubby's stuff and lots of Studio One stuff and Lee Perry and all that kind of stuff. So I was I'm playing a lot of low dubby things. And I know that sounds very weird because the Cox Twins couldn't ever be called dubby. But if you listen to a lot of the bass lines, certainly from sort of um uh, what's it after Heaven Las Vegas? Uh Four Calendar Cafe Four, onwards. Yeah, yeah. Is 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 a lot more lower sort of with my fingers rather than higher stuff with a plectrum. Um, so that's where the style comes from. It's like a, just a mishmash of just whatever seemed the right thing for the song, you know. I don't think I have a style, if I'm really honest. I just think it's just, I don't know. But thanks. Glad you like it. Even if with limited technical skills, yes. Or are so many impressive bass players in Paul Wilson? Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh um, no, this is what you just answered. I, I I left it up so people knew what we were talking about. Here's yeah. one. I don't know why. I think it's just because we all loved our instrument, and it was a time when you could be expressive, and you you know you weren't sort of the guy in the background just sort of keeping the beat. It, you know, because bass players sort of often get a bit of a bad rap, don't they? You know, just play the root note. 
just play this play the bottom play the note that, that, you know just keep stay in your lane yeah just be steady eddie don't don't get above yourself you know the guitarist is the one that's gonna take all the credit anyway so um you just keep the beat don't get yeah. don't get uh, don't get above your station you know and i we were all like, fuck that. Well, yeah, the classism, the classism, of, uh, the classism of music. Yeah. And that's the great thing about punk rock. You know, it's like, it's like, there are no rules. You just play however you want to play. And I mean, the, I mean, Wobble is, is a brilliant example because he really is, he, he started off, I, I would assume, like me, just self taught. I just picked it up and just thought, well, somebody's got to play it. I'll play it. And, you know, developed his own style through that. He was obviously, called jar wobble so he was <laughs> kind of his name pasted him into a certain um, genre but it, it fitted perfectly with the kind of style of, of, of bass playing that the public image needed and it worked perfectly with the drumming so you know i think he and he, obviously he's taken that into his, throughout his own career he still plays in that very fluid fluid way but he he's now massively proficient he's he is mr bass He's a legend. He's a proper bass player. I'm not a proper bass player. I'm just a guy that played bass because, you know, it was prudent. You know, it was. I, <laughs> I needed to to get to get to get from A to B, but I wasn't really into bass playing. I couldn't even tell you that many bass players. I'm not really um, that guy. You're not the bass dude. I'm hey, not what, really. What was the first I'm very thing? proud of it, but it's like it, I, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable. Yeah, you well, you're you, you geek out more over music in in tarot, yeah. like like all of music, not just you're not you're not just the geek basis that's all about the bass. No, and I've never bought bass guitar world or <laughs> have you ever been on the cover of bass guitar world? I've never done I've never done an interview. Never been asked to. Uh, that that that's explains. That tells you the story right there. I'm, I'm obviously not regarded as as good enough, or particularly proficient. But I I never said I was in the first place. I don't profess to be proficient. No. Um, I'm just doing my best. <laughs> that's, that's and it's we... and it's perfect for us. That that was that was perfect. Yeah. Hey, what what was the first record you ever bought? Do you remember? Um. Well, I mean, never mind. The bollocks was the first record I bought with my own with my own pocket money. Um, but I think when I was a bit younger, I used to buy single. You know, we used to buy sort of seven inch singles from from Boots and from Woolworths. Um, I remember having Good Vibrations by the Beach Boys, mm -hmm. uh, which I still love to this day, and I'm sure it was partly because you know I'd, I'd heard it and on the charts and just thought it was amazing and bought it in the shops one day, but I bought this album by the Jackson five. Um, my first album was by the Jackson five called get it together. Um, I didn't realize it was called get it together. I thought it was Git cause it just had a big G and a big I and a big T. And I didn't actually see the get it together bit underneath. I thought Git, that's a really weird title for a record. Oh, well, and it looked colorful and it had this kind of like die cut, sort of sleeve with them all cut out and you kind of pulled it open um wasn't a very good record though so it wasn't like this is my favorite album of all time because it was my first it was actually quite a poor record but it started me off you know in the kind of record buying thing but then um i loved gilbert o'sullivan do you remember gilbert o'sullivan no i don't oh, think well, I well, that, that oh, Gilbert O'Sullivan, it wasn't like the the um, the musical guy, was he? I don't know. No, well, he may have written musicals, but he he, he was like a kind of, um, I don't know what year it would have been, probably like 72, 73, so I'd have been like 10 or 11. And I used to just love his songwriting. Um, very sort of melancholic songs he would have. And he, he was kind of like a, you know, Elton Johnny kind of dude, you know, would sit at the piano and, sing songs but he looked so different to everyone else because he wore kind of like um old-fashioned like sort of mining kind of gear you know had a flat cap on and and a sort of open shirt and braces and 
kind of just looked like a farmer farmer's boy you know or something but i loved uh, i loved gilbert sullivan for about six months um so my early influences before punk were really just really unremarkable and it was it was just never mind the bollocks that was the thing that just ah oh, this is my thing I, I now i get music now i want to be into music because before i was like it's all right you know Beach Boys, yeah, that's a cool single. Gilbo Sullivan, yeah, he's cool. I'd watch it on top of the pops and think it was great. But I wasn't like bothered. I'd be much rather playing football than listening to music. But then when punk happened, that was it. That was that, it. You, were, my you were all in. I had hey, a, this... a youngest of four, so I, it gave me my own thing, you know. Are there some funny questions coming in? There's a, Well, there's a good one about the first time you actually heard your own music on the radio. Oh gosh! I thought, I thought the first time I, I heard music was in Starbucks. That was in America, or, or was in like a Walmart or something. And I heard um, Frosty the Snowman uh, coming through on the. So I don't really remember listening to the radio and hearing the Cocteau Twins, but I suppose it must have happened. No, I'm i'm rubbish on that kind of stuff but I, i'm not very impressed about by my own career <laughs> I mean, that's the thing it's like i don't really sort of jump up and down i think people do now they get so excited when something good happens for them and then but i'm like i don't think we were like that i think we were just like oh well there it is who wants to be on top of the pops anyway we we're just a mis bunch of miseries we really were <laughs> but i was quite excited when i heard um Frosty the Snowman in Walmart or Starbucks or wherever it was. That's that felt like we've arrived now. <laughs> We're getting packed <laughs> through as people are buying their, you know, leggings and makeup and pineapples. Abby is going to kill us. I, with, she, well, she went to bed already. Actually, she told me to turn down the heating. Hold on. <laughs> this is what it's like, everybody. This is this this is the deal with the, the the global cafe. You know, we're in it to win it. It's now we're now at three wow. over three hours. We've been hanging out. We've been hanging out for over three hours. Some of you have been in it for the whole time. I'm curious. Please comment in the comment section if you've been here the whole time. If you've been here the whole time with us for these three hours, yeah, you get um, you get a gold star. I'm just I was just saying that this is the thing about the global cafe. We can hang out for as long as we want because we're just hanging out in a global cafe. And I'm curious who has been on since the beginning. And well, I, I'm, I'm guessing Simon. Do, is it? <laughs> we haven't got anything else to do. Where, where else are we going to go? I think Simon Thornhill, I think he's probably been on the whole time. I'm trying to think who else has been on. Yeah, Greg, he's been on the whole time. David. There are Drew, people, Drew, I'm wondering. Drew, Drew has been there forever. Um, oh, well, yeah. Drew's been on. Yeah, Clark's been on. Yeah. Yeah, we just got like about 10 really cool mates. Um, yeah. But, bass, tell us about playing piano, keyboard for Crops Twins, some of the most beautiful tracks. Oh, well, thank you very much. An underrated element. Adore this mortal cause, Ivy and Neat. Oh, cool. Thank you so much, Anik. That's um, Ivy and Neat is 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 um is was my pet names for my parents. My father's name was Ivor, so he's Ivy, and my mum's name was Nita, so she's Neat. So um, that song was 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 something I wrote uh, for them. Um. Quiz Quest. Now, there's an interesting tune. Now, that, if memory serves me correct, is one of the only tunes probably in history of music where the all the guitars are are played on six-string basses. So Robin and I both had six-string basses on that track. I'm not sure if there's anything else on there other than those. So that's quite an interesting uh curio crushed yes that's a lovely song isn't it um yeah i enjoyed playing the piano on on well on all the cocktail stuff because um it's a beautiful instrument the piano it's, a, it's you can just sit down on it and it sounds great straight off you don't have to do anything you don't have to plug it into something or put it through effects or whatever it just sounds beautiful and i'm not being a real virtuoso i was always looking for um some beautiful element to it, some whether it be melancholic or something. 
So Golden Vein, Crushed, yeah, all lovely things. Thank you, though. Uh, my keyboard playing is something I, I do enjoy very much, and I would probably say I'm more of a piano player than I am even of a bass player, and I'm sure this, some of you will scoff at such a comment, but it's um, just how I feel deep down. Well, you have, you, you have more range. I think you probably get to express more of who you are on the piano than you do with the bass, maybe. Maybe it's just because that's, that's how I express myself more now. Because I don't know, just because the way I work, you know, I have my, my computer just like this, like, 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 like I'm looking at you guys now. I'm, 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 my work station is an iMac and a keyboard, and I work on, on a software program on the computer, and then my piano is sitting here right underneath me so I can just literally pull the drawer out, play the piano and record the music. It's very easy and it's very immediate and I can uh, it, I can sort of write the song on the piano. If I started mm -hmm. off with the bass, it would be more of a struggle. The bass I, I look at is more of a thing that moves the song along and, and helps join the join the dots and, and brings some solidity to the whole thing. But um, I love playing guitar just as much as I like playing bass or keyboards these days. So. I'm not fussy. I'll take whatever compliment you're going to give me. It's well, all... speaking of a compliment, I'm going to give you one because so Melissa Holton wasn't on before when you were when you were dissing your voice. So Melissa, you didn't hear this, but I don't know, an hour, two hours ago, Simon was dissing his voice oh, and saying sweet. he didn't. Yeah, yeah, she loves your voice. Well, that's really very kind of you, Melissa, and um, I, I I'm not going to contradict you because. I, you know, you feel that, and that's beautiful. And I'm sure there's moments on it that are, that I'm, I probably would like if I heard it again. I haven't listened to it. I have to be honest for a long, long time. Painful memories, if I'm if I'm honest. But um, you know, that's how music gets made sometimes. And uh, perhaps I should get over myself and just get on with it and stop being such a pussy about it. But <laughs> I kind of like. I, I think the whole thing is like if I hadn't been in this band that I was in for whatever, 14 years. The singing part might not be such a mental block. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you're in a band with Elizabeth Fraser, anything that follows that is going you're to... You're ruined. <laughs> you're kind of fucked for life. Yeah, you're no ruined. You get close to anything. You, whatever you do, people are going to go, well, it, it's all right, but it's not Elizabeth you know, and I heard, I even if people weren't saying that, that's what I thought they were saying. Um, every review I read of that record, and even if people were saying it's great, what I'd hear them saying is it's great, but it's not Elizabeth Fraser, is it? Okay, but Just get that's what artists are like. We're all very insecure about our um, our talents or lack of them. And, but but, um, but Simon. Get, get over yourself. You you would never, that's that's not who you are anyhow. So you get to be like your awesome you voice has nothing to do with her. No, right? I know. But I know it's stupid, but that's what we're like. And, you know, you, we're all the same, actually. And I don't think I'm, I'm unusual in that. We all have great insecurities and, and negative feelings about our own talents. You know, I'm sure it's you true. do. Yeah, we do. Oh, we for do sure. terrible for sure. sabotage all the time, and I'm 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 the worst. Uh, I, I try and try to do something about it daily, but it, you know, Prince thought he was rubbish. <laughs> we all we all insecure about our talents, and um, that's just the way it's going to be. And all I can do is be very grateful that you have listened to the music, whether it be my record, Cox Twins records. Any record in Berlin and anything that I've been involved with and got some pleasure out of it, that's absolutely, I can't be happier because that's what, what keeps me going. You know, that's why I get up in the morning is to, um, is to, to try and make the world a better place, make it more tolerable to get through the day, whether it's through my own stuff or through help introducing some, you to somebody else's music. It doesn't make a massive amount of difference. Just trying to help. Take the pain away. Take the pain away. Do you think tonight you're going to sleep better or worse after having connected with all these fans? <laughs> oh, that's true tomorrow. Tomorrow, I don't think I have a huge amount on my plate. Just go back in the studio and, and try and do some more mixing and stuff. 
Craig Smith, do you keep in touch with Liz? Absolutely, I keep in touch with Liz, yes. And she sent me a very lovely message on my birthday. And yes, absolutely. Wonderful, one of the wonder, most wonderful human beings on the planet. Um, what else have we got here? The opening music for the Rilkin Dreams film. Yes, oh, I'm glad you like that. I like that too. Uh, yes. So it's, it's never been sort of put on a record or anything. It just exists. We made these two little films. The only two videos we ever made that were that we liked. We, we made so many videos during our career that we absolutely embarrassed by. Um, as 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 I'm sure, if you ask other musicians a similar questions, they'll all, they'll all say same things. Most people hate the videos, um, but we made these two videos quite late in our career. One for um, Half Gifts, and one for Real Key and Heart. And we sort of I, I filmed the I filmed the sections with I had this beautiful old 16 mm millimeter Bolex. Um, and um, I filmed it all on that, and then we gave it to these two geniuses who did a lot of graphics and stuff. Uh, and then we wrote the sort of link pieces to to, 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 to to sort of you know link the two the two the two films together. But we never released them. But yeah, you're right. I've completely forgotten about those. They are lovely, aren't they? Thank you for reminding me about that. I will go back and and have a look at them. The, the, it it only exists on YouTube, it, you have to sort of look for the whole eight minute film. Cause I think somebody sort of cut them up into two videos, you know, the songs, but they do exist as a sort of EP. It was supposed to be four songs and four films, but the record label thought it was a stupid idea and didn't want to give us the money. So it was, it was ended up being two. What else we got here? Um, I'm asking about the tour. Like if you'd come to, this one you you kind of alluded to maybe oh, but i would love to you know uh eric i would love to come i love playing in america it's one of my favorite places to play but you know the band to date anyway as a live entity is unwieldy and financially uh we we, we just couldn't make it work it's a seven piece band you know which is just these days, just well, especially right now, no, there's no shows to play. But uh, I, I would love to play there, but I'd have to work out how to do these songs in a completely different way with a with a much smaller band. And I'm not sure I can because just the way the records are made, with all the different vocalists, some boys, some girls, some high vocals, some low vocals, some soft, some hard. You know, it's you can't get one singer to do all of that. So it's um it's a tricky one. And it's why I never thought Lost Horizons would play a show. But um, Richie was so determined to do touring that I managed to make it happen. But it was exhausting. and I lost so much money of my own money doing it. I was happy to lose it because I really wanted to do it and it was fun. But I don't know if I could do it again. I don't know if I could afford to do it again. Not that I'm not a wealthy man, but um, who knows? Uh, who knows? We shall see. We shall see. I've got lots of friends who um, say things like, we'll be your backing band. Like the Penal Bia guys, they, they all say that. We'll be it. We'll do it. We can we can make it sound good. And I'm like, well, mm, we'll see. You never know. You never know. It's different the way you compose music today than 30 years ago. <laughs> Truly it isn't. I was just thinking about this the other day. It, even though it's much quicker, it's much quicker. It's exactly the same way, but just slightly different, if, I, if that makes any sense. So before, if I'm in a, a room with, with Robin, me and him sitting in a room, for example, I'll plug in the bass, he'll plug in the guitar, we'll jam around in 10 minutes, be like, that's good, keep doing that, we'll be playing along to the drum machine. And then half an hour later, yes, we've got a tune, we've worked it out, we'll record it together, and then over the next day or so, we'll add and layer and blah 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 i still do exactly the same way but i just do it on my own so i go in the studio with richie initially who's the drummer and we just mess about jam do the same thing robin and i did kind of except he's playing the drums and i'm either playing the guitar or the piano and then i'll bring it back home and then i'll build it layer by layer until i go oh that sounds like a song or oh, could be 
so actually it's exactly the same and i think that is very very strange um but also not very strange and shows how limited I, my talents actually are because i'm still doing things exactly the same way simon which release on Bell union are you most proud of sell it to me <laughs> chris jackson chris who are you and why would you say such a thing um <laughs> Oh, I see. Sell it to me. Like, uh, you know, I'll get it. Let, right. like, yeah, pitch it. Pitch it. Yeah. Pitch yeah. It, man. Uh, you can buy it off our website. Just go on bellunion.com. <laughs> That's how you buy it, man. Um, well, I would never push anything down your throat, but um, 23 years of releasing records is just is, is, uh, it's a lot, a lot of choice there, man. Um, sell me your most proud record. Okay, here's one for you. John Grant, Queen of Denmark, 2010. How am I going to sell it to you? Well, I'll tell you this, Mr. Jackson. In 1998, literally a few months after I started the label with Robin initially, I got a cassette from a band called The Czars, C-Z-A-R-S from Denver. And a nice letter from the singer, John, uh, who said, uh, I'm a big fan of Cox Twins, and I saw you started a record label. Could I send you this tape? And I listened to the tape, and I wrote back. And I said, John, uh, thank you very much for the tape. Um, I really don't like it at all, um, but there's something about your voice which I'm interested in, and maybe keep doing it, keep writing stuff, and I'd be happy to hear the next bunch of tunes you come up with. A month goes by, he sends me another tape. Not much better, really, if I'm honest, but his voice was getting better. And this went on for about six months, and then eventually he sent me a, a, set, a set of demos, and I was like, oh, you guys have really worked hard. Uh, I don't think you're ready to make a record yet, but I'm going to take a a big gamble and I'm going to bring you over to London to, to the Cocteau studio and I'm going to put you up and I'm going to produce your debut album and you, and, and, and it's going to be one of the first releases on Bell Union. So that's what happened. I signed the band. I produced the first record. It was called Before But Longer. It was John Grant's first band. And they were beautiful records. He made three with the band, the Zars. All great. And they were all reviewed, well, uh, not, not by that many people, but the, all the reviews were very favourable, but nobody else liked them. They didn't sell any records. And the band kind of fizzled out into nothingness, and John descended into um, a period of terrible depression. Uh, he was on suicide watch for a while. Um, and he was taking an awful lot of drugs and he was in a horrible, horrible mess and was not doing at all well. And having previously played a show with one of my other bands, Midlake, he'd made a friendship with them. And hearing of John's distress, the guys from Midlake contacted him on his hospital bed and said, why don't you come down to Texas, where we all live, and hang out with us, and we'll look after you and make you better, and you can record in our studio, because we're making our record there. And why don't you come and hang out? You're too good to be not making music. Come on, get yourself down here. So John Grant got out of his hospital bed and got himself down to Denver, De to Denton, I apologize, in Texas, and over the course of the next year, made the songs with Midlake that came out on the album The Queen of Denmark. Now, I'll just tell you a very quick ending to that story that is the sort of catalyst for why John Grant has become one of our most successful artists and, and is hugely revered all over the world now. So... The editor of Mojo magazine, which at the time and still still is important, but but at the time was was like a huge two hundred three hundred thousand uh, copies a month would be sold, and and the album of the month in Mojo was massive. 
for a label or any label to get album of the month in mojo massive full page review full page review on on one side and a massive illustration of the artist on the other it was something that they did in this magazine now the editor of the magazine was in my office and i was playing him some of the new mid lake songs that i'd just received because he was a huge fan of theirs and he was very excited to hear them and i brought him over to the office to have a listen he said right listen mate i've got to go um lovely to see you let's catch up soon and i was just about to show him out the door and i remembered that i hadn't played him some of the John Grant stuff that he'd made with Midlake. I said, Phil, can I just keep you here for five minutes more? I just want to play something real quick. Do you remember the Zars? He went, no, I don't remember them. I said, well, blah, blah, blah. They were this band, blah, blah, blah. They made this, he's made this record with, with John, with the, with the Midlake guys. He went, yeah, cool. Let me hear it. So I played him one song and he was very quiet and he said, you got the else. So I played him another song. And I knew he was late now because he'd we'd been looking at his watch for quite a while. But he said, can I hear another one? So I played him another one. And then he, at the end of the, the third song, he was like, mate, that is, that is the best thing I've heard in years. What the fuck? Okay, I'm off. I'm out of here. So he, off he went and did his thing. And to cut a long story short, because it is a long, long story, um, he ended up making that album, the album of the month in Mojo. And... John Grant, having been, you know, in this band that nobody gave a fuck about, now age 42, coming with his first solo record of his life, is now on about to get some credit for his music, finally. And that was uh, obviously a catalyst moment um, for his career to, to start to take off. Of course, you have to follow it up with amazing music and great shows and John being the artist that he is, he he did do that, and that's all down to John. That's it, the credit he deserves. But that is the, one of the stories that makes me the most proud because it shows the family vibe of the label. Mm -hmm. Yes, I put the record out, but my part in it is quite peripheral. The reason that, the reason that John had the success is because he took the risk to go down there, and the Midlake guys had it in their heart and their soul excuse me, and in their soul, to invite him into their already busy life. They're making their own really important third record, Courage of Others. I mean, it's incredible. It's an incredible story, if you actually think about it. To, they, he went around, you know, he was couch surfing for, for six months, living in, in all the different members' houses. Well, you know, we're all young families and married couples with babies, but they all invited him into their homes. And I just think, wow, man, that's, that is such a beautiful thing for them to have done. And then to play on the record and help produce it, you know, that, that, that kind of thing, like you can't buy that because it's, it's all about humanity. So that makes me the proudest. I don't know if it'll make you kind of go and buy the record. I don't know if I sold it to you as a record, but it is an absolute genius album. So there well, you go. You know that much. Yeah, re records are about the stories and they're about the artists. And so Chris Jackson, if you weren't sold by that story, I don't know what would sell you. Yeah, I think he's gone. <laughs> I think he went to bed like half an hour ago. I think we missed it. <laughs> oh, well, cheer, Chris. Never mind. Craig Smith, how's Bodie doing? Oh, you didn't see Bodie then, I guess. He popped in and said goodnight to everyone before he went out and had his shit in the garden. Um, DAW or still tape? Oh, yeah. Chris, you... No, Chris is still there, sold. Oh, he's still there. Oh, good, good, good. Well, you will be able to find that record on um, on all good on all good record shop websites, Amazon included, if you must. But um, you can buy it on ours. Uh, yeah, that, that that is a lovely story. You're right, and it's um, there's lots and lots of great stories when you do a label and you get through it. After 23 years, there's lots of terrible stories, and you, you know other moments where you think, "Gee, how did we get through that one?" But uh, I think Queen of Denmark, in a way, because it's like right bang in the middle. It's sort of not exactly halfway through the label, but but it's after after a period. And John had been signed to the label for twelve years, so he had twelve years of no one giving a shit about his music, and then he finally makes his first solo album, age forty two, and it and it becomes a hit. And you're like, yeah, it gives belief to a lot of older artists, and, uh, and you know, because a lot of things people get to sort of thirty these days, and they think. Uh, there's no point me sending a record to anyone to, to a label because they're not going to want to sign me. Well, you know what? 
That's not true. John Grant had a success at 42. We love yeah. a good underdog story, and that's a good oh, underdog no. story. Me too, me too, me too. GMF, what a song. Well, correct, Joaquin, Joaquin Cafe. That's not your real name, surely. Joaquin Cafe. <laughs> if it is, it's a great surname. Um, and Healed, watch LPRs, watch Lost Horizons for Bar. Yes, I know what you mean. Mm, there's yeah. this there's this question too what is it um have you heard sweater no. weather by the neighborhood the hook is virtually identical to size smell of farewell is it a coincidence i, I don't know because I, I i i don't know what you mean by coincidence um oh you mean like maybe did they not hear it i don't know you have to ask them i guess sweater weather <laughs> um yeah, I'll check it out, man. It's always nice to hear your stuff in other people's music sometimes. Um, it's flattering. But I, as I say, I, I think a lot of plagiarism is is not intended. A lot of it is, is just through sort of osmosis almost, you know what I mean? You kind of just take this stuff in and out it comes. I don't think anyone sits around going, let's write a song that sounds like that. It just sort of happens. And then someone points it out like a few months later and you're like, shit so it does you know i mean i get artists all the time who will go in the studio to make their new album and then halfway through they'll send me a message or a voice text going holy shit i've just i'm just panicking can you tell me if this song sounds like something else you've heard before you know because we all do it you know there, there's only so many chord sequences and there's only so many ways to, to construct a melody and, and sometimes you I'm in Raymond Raj is friends with the. Oh, that's right. Yes, Raj. What a lovely girl. He's a Cocteau's fan, wasn't he, Abby? The neighbourhood. That's right. Yeah, we saw this amazing artist in. Uh, where did we see him? In in LA, was it? In Texas. It's funny. I talking to my wife on Facebook Live, and we live. In I know, the same. It's kind of funny, right? Awesome. <laughs> I agree with Simone. What about do you? What do you agree with me about? The place or the man? Sorry, I'm a bomber. I don't really understand what's happening. Yeah, sometimes what happens, I think, in the feed is that we'll they might be replying to somebody else's comment, but we can't see that it's a reply to somebody else. Oh, I, I think see. that that's what happened. I get you. LA have we tired? Have we have we tired you out, or are you like you, you just want yeah. you just want to pull an all nighter? I, Oh no, I, I probably should should get to bed fairly soon. But um, you know, it's lovely to see all these people and and uh, uh, and and help and have the have them over at your house. They're over at your yeah. house right now. I, 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 exactly. But um, no, I feel fine. But I, yeah, I probably should get to bed soon because otherwise I'm I might have no sleep at all, and I need to get a little bit because I didn't get much last night. Really. Cool. At all. We'll get we'll get one more. This is this is kind of a good question. So we'll do that. This, this can be our last question. Okay. And it's about any insights into how Evo did things now that you've been at the helm of Bella Union. Like looking back. Um, well, the, the interesting part of that question, I suppose, is 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 more about um, le learning from things that, that someone else did that you didn't really because there's lots of things you can admire and they're obvious aren't they you know you can look at sort of the stylist the, 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 the stylistic side of, of a label and think well you know i'd love i'd love my label to have that a similar kind of aesthetic or it is very easy to be about to look about the positive things the harder the harder bit is to sort of work out what, what things you don't like and try and make sure that you don't replicate those and i think um it, it, the best lessons we learn in life surely are, are from the mistakes not from the things that go well um and i know there were plenty of things that were great about 4ad and and I, I don't think they they get enough credit really in the 4ad in the cocktail twin story anyway because it's always like oh the band hated the label and they fell out with them and blah 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 it's all it's always sort of like with this a negative slant because we left and we went to a major and oh it must have been so acrimonious and stuff well, well there were things said and there were, there were no breakup 
in history, whether it's with a band with a label or, or a girl with a guy or, a, a, you know, two blokes breaking up or two girls breaking up, it's never easy. A breakup is tough, relationship-wise or label-wise. And it was um, messy for, for, for a while, but I stepped back from it a second. You'd say, well, hold on a minute. 4AD was amazing for the Cocteau Twins. Um, Cocteau Twins was amazing for 4AD. Works two ways, right? Yeah. But there were things about it that I noticed that I was like, oh, yeah. if I if I do a label one day, I don't want to do that. I wouldn't do that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, our contracts wouldn't say that. And I wouldn't make bands do this. And I wouldn't own their stuff for, forever and ever and ever. So there's things you pick up along the way where you go, I don't agree with that. That That's not a cool thing that they did then. But you also have to say, when you're saying critical things about a label in the 80s, about how they did things, you also have to acknowledge that everybody did the same things. They weren't doing it because they wanted to be a, be twats about it. You know, things that were appearing in contracts in the 80s, like the contracts we signed, which meant that 480 owned our stuff forever, which they do. Um, whilst that's painful always, to know that we'll never ever get back control of our music ever, 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 ever. It wasn't their fault. It was just the way business was yeah. in those days. Everybody's contract was like that. Everybody's. But in later life, some artists were able to get those contracts re, uh, you know, reworded and rewritten. And some of the labels that they worked with probably went, you know, maybe those working practices aren't cool anymore. We'll give you a brand new deal that's that means you get your songs back at some point because that's fair right well 4ad haven't done that yet and um, maybe they will maybe they won't uh that's not my decision that's their decision so these things are the things you learn and from day one i pretty much said well i don't want to ever own anybody's stuff so uh, belly union only licenses music from the artists never from another label i also don't want to to, to work with uh, i mean people sort of people make assumptions about things like oh uh, well you 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 licensed the fleet foxes record from sub pop no i didn't no i never did i never did i licensed the record from fleet foxes fleet foxes signed to sub pop for america and to Bell union for europe that's that's what they did and I can work with Fleet Foxes. I don't want to work with Sub Pop. I love them, but I don't want to work with them um, because it's very hard working with other labels. So, um, you know, this stuff you pick up along the way. And listen, I'm no saint. I don't know everything about business. And I certainly didn't know shit about it when I started the label. It took me at least five years to even know what any of the stuff I was supposed to be doing was. Um, I'm a slow learner, but I, once I've got it right, um there you go you know so i think the, 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 that stuff is i feel good about because i know i know no one is going to come to me in 10 15 years time and goes man you fucking ripped us off you know you're gonna have our stuff forever and that's not fair and i'd be like no you're right it isn't fair that's why you you I think fox has got back there got back their recordings uh what was it five, six, seven years after the album came out. So I don't make any money from Fleet Foxes records anymore. Um, Cause that's what I think's fair. Yeah. People do these days, 50, 50 deals. You know, I spend, I spend it and we share the profits. That's kind of fair. It's fair. Um, and the deals are very short, but listen, if you want 50 grand, I'm going to want to have it for a lot longer than five years because I'm never going to get my money back otherwise. So you have to sort of, as an artist, you have to be like fair as well. It works both ways. You can't say I want 50 grand, but I only want a five year deal. Cause I'd be like, well, you, good luck then. So go somewhere else. Cause I'm never going to give you that because it's not fair. Cause I'll never get it back in five years ever. Impossible. You know, 10 maybe, but probably not. I actually probably think 15 is about the right number there. So, you know, you you negotiate what you think is fair. So that's what I've learned from that period. But Ivo was um, an extraordinary a and man who uh, curated one of the greatest periods of uh, UK independent music. Oh, not UK necessarily, but uh, as a UK label signing bands from all over the world with amazing taste. And I 
have the utmost admiration for him for what he did. And I know it's not easy. And I'm sure when he stopped doing it, he felt a huge sigh of relief. Because it's difficult. <laughs> when you get very close with your balance and it doesn't work out, you feel shit, utterly shit. Uh, he really was brilliant, wasn't he? Yes, he was really brilliant. Well, Simon, thank you so much for taking this time with us. It, people are like, Fabio made the comment, thank you so much, best thing in the quarantine. You've you've actually you you've made some you've made some fans and music lovers happy happy happy. Well, I love talking about music and any little gems of anecdotes that I may have had from my interesting life that I can pass on. It's always helpful, isn't it? It's always gives people some hope and um, makes people see things in a slightly different way, and and I think that's good. We always keep listening to other people's stories and. Right now, I think this is the time to be doing a chat like this. I mean, normally I'd be like, three hours, forget about it. I'm talking about talking all this stuff for three hours. But right now, like, we are in a lockdown. We, we've got no one to talk to about, you know, we've got ourselves, we've got our partners, and we've got our dog, and we can sit and watch Netflix. And, and yet these listening parties and things like this where I can connect momentarily with people that um, – are interested it's a lovely thing sharing sharing thoughts and, and and feelings about music uh i don't shy away from that and i've really enjoyed talking to you i Thank love you. talking to you please give bodhi a pet and abby a hug i can't wait i can't I wait to meet her at some point we have we have to oh, we have to you and you and abby and kenny and i have to have a double date oh that's a definite that's a definite yeah well i think i can't remember why she didn't come with me to meet them that year there was a reason abby are you still awake maybe you remember i think you were in 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 new york still maybe what what year was it melissa 2012 it was 20 and now it was maybe 20 it was at, it was the year that bowie died so 2016 oh really was it that recent yeah it oh, was it was recent there. but it's there just kind of it's, we normally it, go these things together um, but there must have been a reason why we didn't. Maybe it was so bloody expensive. That's probably why. It was, wasn't it? It was pretty expensive. Kenny went back once, has been back once since then, but... Yeah, I yeah. haven't been again since then, I don't think. Or maybe I went back the following year and, and thought, and, uh, <laughs> we just love going to, to New... We, we started going to this new festival in New York called New Colossus. Well, I actually haven't been at all. We were supposed to go this year. Abby went to the first year last year. And um, with Penelope Isles, and they had the most amazing time. And I was going to go this year with her to see see uh, Pompoko and Tim Burgess, but I wasn't very well, and then she wasn't very well, so we never made it. And then and then it got called off anyway with South by Southwest straight after it got cancelled. So we we've really missed out on our usual annual festival trips this year, and there won't be any more really. Primavera's off, and Great Escape, which we'll be having here in Brighton, that's cancelled. So. We shall all have to just console ourselves with Mimi's Global Cafe. <laughs> Is that what it's called? Yeah, Mimi's Global Cafe. Oh, there Simon, oh, give you a hug. Yeah, hug to you guys. Say hi to Kenny for me. I will. Well, and you be well. And and thanks to all of you who have hung out with us for this time. Yeah, thank it's you all so much. You've got like the patience of Job. I have the patience of Job. My bladder is not the bladder of Job, though. So, oh, well, that's, that's, <laughs> especially because you know the PG tips. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I didn't go for PG tips. I just went for water. But I, I'm usually, you know, quite quite happy to go to the bathroom several times a night. But tonight, no, not needed it. Thanks to you guys, you kept me kept me clean. Excellent. Well, love to everybody and have a wonderful night and stay well and be well, okay? Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Melissa. You're and welcome. It's been, um, it's, been a, it's been it's been wonderful, hasn't it? It is. It is. Yeah. Connecting. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn off the thing, but then it's not okay. gonna kick you off. It's just we're gonna stop being live just so that you know. Okay, bye to the world. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye now.